In compliance with Governor Newsom's executive order N2920 in response to the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak, the district will conduct the Board of Education's meeting as a teleconference. Given the health risks associated with COVID-19, the Newport Mesa Unified School District has decided not to open the boardroom to the public. For Spanish interpretation, it will be available via the Zoom link. Roll call, Rosie. Trustee Yelsey. Here. Trustee Bartow. Here. Trustee Matoye. Here. Trustee Anderson. Here. Trustee Crane. Here. Trustee Wigan. Here. Trustee Ursailu. Mr. Lee Sung. Here. And Trustee Ursoilu called me. She had her second COVID shot yesterday and it hit her about an hour. So we'll, she'll see if she can join. Uh, community input on closed session items only. Uh, we have no comments. Is that correct, Rosie? That is correct. Okay, so we, we will dismiss that. Um, we will now move to closed session. The items are 4A, conference with legal counsel, one case. 4B, conference with legal counsel, one case. 4C, conference with legal counsel, one case. 4D, threat to public services or facilities. 4E, conference with labor negotiator. 4F, public employee discipline, dismissal, release, employment. 4G and 4H, public employee discipline, Dismissal, release, employment number 202103HR and 202104HR. Well, we, we will return to open the session at 6 p.m. with the readouts. Thank you. All board members, please log out and log in to closed session. And we'll see everyone else at 6 p.m. Thank you. Everyone, it's six, it's six o'clock and we will begin our regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, we just returned from closed session. I have two readouts. In closed session, the Board of Education took action to approve the resignation agreement and general release for number 202103HR. The roll call vote was as follows. Seven ayes, zero noes. In closed session, the Board of Education took action to approve the agreement for number 202104HR. The roll call vote was seven ayes. Two no's. How could that be? I'm sorry, zero no's. <laughs> sorry Thank you. about that. Thank you. It's a math thing. <laughs> Man. Um, now we'll have opening ceremonies, a moment of reflection, and pledge to the flag led by Trustee Bartow. Please rise. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next, we have adoption of the agenda, and I'd like to move, uh, recommend that we move item 18A, which is transition of elementary schools to level one, beginning April 21st, before item 15. So do I have a motion? So moved as amended. Second. Uh, moved by Trustee Mutwaye, seconded by Trustee Crane. Rosie. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Ursula? <coughs> 3521, 3921, and 31621. Can I ask a question? I have my hand up. I don't know if you could see. Yes. I was wondering, I was looking at some of I was looking at them, and there are a few that it seems like some items that maybe used to be there, it didn't extrapolate like or explain kind of what was going on in them. So I was wondering if there's any way we can have kind of more information embedded in some of the minutes instead of it, it reads, some of it reads just like it's an outline. So I would for further discussion at another time, but it's not really a point in time minute. It doesn't explain like what half of it's talked about. 
Well, the, the minutes are available, correct, Rosie? The video. Uh, they are available online. They're posted online. That is correct. Okay. Right, but so it will just say like, there was a board report. So like, I think I just would like to see if there was a little more detail or going back. I know oftentimes when I go back to meetings, it says trustee said this, or I just think it would be helpful if we put a little more detail. Okay, that's, we can discuss that. First. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Are the sessions recorded? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, do we have a motion? So moved. A second. second. Okay, moved by That's Trustee Quain, Crane, seconded by Trustee Wagon. Roll call vote. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Trustee <laughs> Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wagon? Yes. Number 10, introduction of staff school resource officer program. Dr. Jack. Yes, good evening, thank you. Uh, we are excited to uh, talk a little bit about our school resource officer, our SRO program within the district and the support that we get from both Newport Beach PD and Costa Mesa PD and in, in, in order to allow us to run this program and to support our schools. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Phil D'Agostino who is the um, liaison between the district and both police departments and uh, is the liaison with the SRO program. So Dr. D'Agostino. Good afternoon, members of the board uh, and cabinet. It's good to see you. Uh, can you see my uh, my PowerPoint presentation? Am, am I good there? I'm sorry, I can't hear anyone. Yes, Phil, it's up. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. So uh, again, good afternoon. Uh, we have just a, a few slides to share with you as we introduce new staff members. Um, as you know, we work with two partner agencies, uh, great partnerships that we value immensely in keeping our schools safe, but also in creating um, uh, a, a culture of community uh, where law enforcement works as a partner in the overall holistic education of all of our students and supports our families throughout the district. Uh, just a brief overview. Uh, the SRO program has been in place for over 20 years started in the wake of the Columbine shooting where funding became more accessible for programs like this to, to start. We have been sharing the costs of our school resource officers between our partner agencies and the district since that time. Um, the selection of school resource officers is not something that is taken lightly. We're very, very grateful to both chiefs of police um, who uh, direct their command staff to ensure that our school resource officers uh, are, are selected for qualities like empathy, communication, being able to work with students, um, being able to be collaborative and communicative, as well as responsive to the needs of the district as they are articulated through either the superintendent's office directly or, or through my office as the liaison for school resource officers. All, all of our school resource officers get special training and that training is given by national entities or state entities like the National Association for School Resource Officers or NASRO. And um, we're really proud of the systems that we've put into place, uh, such as regular meetings with SRO supervisors, regular meetings with our school resource officers in the field, um, the expectation that school resource officers will attend games and be a part of the culture of the schools that they patrol. It really is akin to the community-based policing where there is a lot of evidence uh, historically that community-based policing works to, um, to uh, create uh, better relationships and more peaceful communities uh, throughout the country. So um, again, just briefly, this is the structure of our school resource officer program. And uh, the, the officers that are in bold are our new officers uh, who we're introducing to you tonight. And they should have their cameras on. Um, officer Melendez is our newest officer on the Costa Mesa side of town. He is now working with 
uh, Officers Nguyen and Rank, and Officer Rank is with us tonight as well. Um, Officer Rank has uh, is is helping with uh, covering Officer Nguyen's duties, and then also we're really glad to have on board Sergeant Selinsky. He's here with us tonight. Sergeant, good to see you. He is the new SRO supervisor, replacing uh, Jim Brown, who has now moved up in their organization. On the Newport Beach side of town, uh, the newest officer is Officer Garrett Gergens. And I don't know if Officer Gergens is here. Yes, but we're here. We're just uh, working on our video. Got it. So th they are there. And um, it's good to uh, hear your voices as well, um, Team Newport. And then um, with that said, I am going to hand it over to the lead uh, veteran school resource officer on the Newport Beach side of town. Um, she's asked me to refer to her as that long title, actually. No, I'm kidding. Um, officer Fabry is going to tell you a little bit about a day in the life of an SRO. Thank you, Phil. I did not ask for the introduction, but I do appreciate it. Um, like Officer Gergen said, we are working on our video right now. It was working and all our IT uh, staff is gone for the day. So we're working on getting our video up. But uh, while I'm here, we just wanted to discuss what a day in the life of an SRO might look like. Um, we get a lot of questions about what we do from day to day, even from our own organization. Sometimes people just don't understand um, or, or don't know what we do. So um, I kind of wanted to lay it out. Now, obviously this is a day in the life in a typical day. Um, and I say typical in air quotes because not every day is typical and every day is a little different. Um, but just to, to kind of show you, sorry about that, we're not going back. <laughs> there we go. Um, so our days typically start off by coming straight to the police station and dressing out into uniforms here. Uh, most of us have offices here at the station where we can check our emails and return any parent phone calls or staff phone calls that we uh, may have received during off hours. Um, we can review any active or pending detective cases related to our students on campus um, or any other juveniles that reside in the city or uh, do anything else in the city. Those cases tend to come to us. Then we'll go to campus, check in with our administrators. Um, there we get kind of like our daily brief to see if there's anything going on on campus or any matters that might need our attention. Um, from there, we will interact with staff, students, and parents throughout the day. This could mean a variety of different things, but um, some of them being PTA meetings, educational presentations, um, safety drills, or any other kind of uh, meetings that we are asked to attend by staff. Um, after school, like Phil mentioned, we tend to go to the football games or other sporting events that are on campus, and that will usually sum up our day to finish any phone calls or take care of any emails um, from the school day. We like to check in with our supervisors and make sure they're up to speed on whatever happened during the day and check in with each other um, to help support each other. So that's just a quick example of what a day might look like for us. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thanks, Officer Fabry. Um, who else is there with you this afternoon? We have the three of us, uh, so Officer Tillman, Officer Gergens, and myself uh, at the moment. So we are here. Excellent. Um, and then now I'd like to uh, take a moment, to, again, in the interest of equal time to our partner agencies, I'd like to give Officer Rank an opportunity to say a few words uh, for the Costa Mesa Police Department. Officer Rank, good to see you. It's good to see you too, sir. Um, just wanted to let you guys know that the SRO program is mostly having to deal with school safety. Uh, we work hand in hand with the community and it's more of a community based uh, oriented type policing uh, where we're looking at more of a preventative approach rather than a reactive approach. And some of the things that we do to keep it under that preventative measures is like the grip program. It keeps the gang reduction. It's a gang reduction uh, intervention program to try to keep the gang violence out of the schools through education and keep these kids, uh, you know, engaged with law enforcement, kind of getting to know us and getting to know our roles and have them understand that, hey, we're here for them and give them the resources that they need, especially at a young age where this program is uh, put in for elementary and some of the middle school kids. 
We also want to work hand in hand with our uh, personnel, whether it be at the high school, elementary or middle school schools to make sure we're with the uh, admin, trying to find out what discipline is uh, appropriate for certain circumstances and work together as a team. Because with the kids, it's all about rehabilitation, not necessarily punishment. And maybe we could find some way to get this kid to be a, you know, a productive member of society, because I think that's all of our goals here. We all want kids to thrive and want them to have the best environment possible. I think that for us as law enforcement, we like to bridge that gap with the community here at the SRO program, where we have a lot of issues that happen at home that carries right over into the schools. You know, maybe a kid that's a straight A student is going through quite a bit, a lot of stuff at home and the school counselors will help us uh, show those at risk kids. And maybe we can go take a look at what the issues are at home and maybe start looking into welfare checks and go down the child protective services route. Um, we also like to provide law enforcement uh, education as guest speakers uh, for staff members and kids. Uh, as far as like the run, hide, fight model, we try to make sure that the classroom, whether it be the teacher, administrator, or kids are educated in that. When that time comes, we give those presentations. We also try to do classes as far as like DUI and drug ex, uh, being a drug expert and trying to show them what these things that they hear about heroin, meth, what they actually do to the body, kind of like how the old D.A.R.E. program used to be out there except it's just Melendez and I on this side of town. And then obviously our great partners at Newport. Um, we try to make sure that we build those relationships with the kids, right? This is a job where as a police officer on the streets, you might see a person, you may never see that person again. Here's a school resource officer. I'm able to build that relationship with the kids in the community to where they feel comfortable coming and telling about a lot of these crimes that would not come to light if it was not for us to be in that spot. I think the main objective for all of us here is to have a relationship that uh, is thriving and we can work as a team. And one of those things is to de-escalate some of these situations uh, as we see with the Boulder and uh, some of these other communities that are going through these active shooter events, having a police officer on staff and being able to help you guys with uh, safety measures, I think it only benefit all of us in the long run as far as being ready and preventing hopefully a future event. Um, that's all I got. I hope that was uh, helpful in some way. Thanks, Officer Rank. Appreciate uh, those words. And, and uh, members of the board, thank you very much for your time. I want to thank uh, Sergeant uh, Selinsky and Officer uh, Melendez, who are also here on the Costa Mesa side of town, and the school resource officers on the Newport Beach side of town, uh, as well for being here tonight and, and introducing the newest officer there at Newport Harbor, Officer Gergens. Uh, we appreciate the partnership that you've allowed us to create with our two partner law enforcement agencies, and um, thank you for the time tonight. Thank you, Dr. Diagostino. And I have to say, I am so proud of the collaboration between our two cities and our police departments in having our school resource officer program. It's amazing. Every time we get a new resource officer, and quite often they leave because they've received a promotion, they've re they, they all go through a very rigorous application process, I know, to become a, an SRO. And every time they leave, one leaves and we get another one, I can't imagine they'll be as good. And they always really fill the sho shoes of the next one. So we really do appreciate everything you do. I know my children graduate, they're in their thirties now and they still remember Officer Monarch who was their SRO at the time. And I think all the kids in this district feel that same way. They, they have a real connection um, to the officers who are at their school every day. So thank you, thank you, thank you all so very much. And President Yelsey, it looks like Newport Beach has gotten their video up and running, so uh, they can give us a wave right now. Good to see you folks. Thank Sorry you. for the delay. <laughs> okay, now we have so many recognitions tonight. This is exciting. The next item is recognized board certified teacher, Mrs. Olson. Thank you, and yes, it is very exciting. It is uh, with great pleasure that I'm here tonight to share with you and introduce, so she really doesn't need an introduction, um, our, the latest teacher on our, with us to receive a national board certification. And before I do that, I just wanna give everyone a little bit of background because people not familiar with it, 
really don't understand what an accomplishment this truly, truly is. And so the national board certification, it's based on national standards and six um, propositions uh, stating that teachers are committed to students and their learning. Teachers know the subjects they teach and how to teach those subjects to students. Teachers are responsible for managing and monitoring student learning. Teachers think systematically about their practice and learn from experience. And teachers are members of the learning communities. And I think that you are going to find that this candidate truly, she really doesn't need an introduction. She really does um, exhibit all of those things and everything that she does. But to get the board certification, candidates have to complete four components. They have to demonstrate content knowledge. They have to create an extensive portfolio that illustrates differentiation in instruction teaching practice and learning environment, and effective and reflective practitioner. So all of those components. And it is very difficult to obtain this as well as maintain it. In fact, it is so special that in our district, we only have 1% of our teachers who achieve this goal. In the state of California in 2019, there were only 7,329 Mm. board certified teachers. So we are very, very blessed to have her with us. So again, tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Shelly Maimin. Recently, um, the, her certification was in literacy, reading, reading, language arts, and early and middle childhood. She's been with us for 16 years. She started with a very, very brief moment in substitute. And I think they saw that in her then and picked her up and she was on a contract. And she served us as a teacher and a TOSA in many of our schools and very highly respected and involved because I think you all recognize her. She wasn't here too long ago. So congratulations, Shelley. We're very proud of you and happy to have you on our staff. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Shelley, if you'd like to say something, and I don't think we could hear you before. Oh, hi. I said thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Can you hear me now? Get it in person tonight, but I do have a certificate that we will be presenting to you. So thank you so much. We all realize how difficult it is to achieve this status. Um, did she want to see it again? <laughs> Carol wanted to see it again. Okay. Um, we, we realize how difficult it is to achieve this status. And we thank you for every capacity you've served at at different schools and just appreciate having teachers like you in our district. So thank you so much. It, I think Trustee it's, Matoye. Thank you so much. Yes, you have to switch, we have to pause. Thank you so much, Shelley. I think a testament of the quality of educator that you are, we met you as a math expert, but yet your national board certification is in English language arts. So the students that you work with are one lucky group of kids. We are so blessed to have you on our Newport Mesa Hall of Fame. Thank you. You here in person. <laughs> yeah. If we could, someday soon, hopefully. Thank you. And next we have a recognition of the 2020-21 Teacher of the Year recipients. Um, I'd like to call on Tamara Fairbanks, NMFT president, who will introduce the two recipients. Good evening. It is my honor and privilege to celebrate Emily Matthews and Dennis Ashendorf as our 2021 NMUSD Teachers of the Year. Both candidates have advanced to the Orange County Teacher of the Year competition. Every employee in the district is welcome to nominate teachers for this recognition. All nominees are invited to complete an application. These applications are then reviewed by past teachers of the year, NMFT officers, and NMFT retired representatives. The district finalists com complete a second application, have classroom observations, and are interviewed by the committee. And this process is very similar to the Orange County and the California Departments of Education. NMFT manages the application and selection process. We help coordinate the teachers' applications with, or with the Orange County Department of Ed. Um, we also provide a small gift to these outstanding teachers. This is just an example of our union recognizing the hard work of our, 
of the employees of a district. Thank you for supporting the Teacher of the Year program. Thank you to Jamie Rapp, our Teacher of the Year committee chair for her hard work this year. And now for a short video recognizing our teachers. And you will enjoy this video that's coming up next. Is it playing? Tamara, is it playing? I hear the audio, but I do not see the video. I do not believe it's shared. Let me restart it. Still no? No, we're not view viewing the video. Looking for the video. I too have <laughs> certificates for each of you, Emily and Dennis. So thank you. Wish you could be here in person. And we wish we could celebrate with you at the Newport Mesa Schools Foundation dinner that normally we have as well. So. Um, I know you're missing out a lot of celebrations, but it doesn't make make your award any less significant. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's an honor. Again, thank you, President Yelsey, board members, President Fairbanks and Superintendent Lee Sung for approving our nominations for, for Teacher of the Year. I'm sure Emily feels the same way. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to be able to get this? Or? Let's see. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Yes. This year for the Teacher of the Year program, we didn't want to change the integrity of our program. Therefore, we took um, our finalists from last year who have already been vetted went through the entire process. I think one of the best qualities about uh, Emily Matthews is her ability to uh, build relationships first and foremost with her students. And then she has also just really worked with our team here to provide resources and support, not just for her own students, but also for families and students here at Davis. What I love most about being a teacher are the relationships that I can build with my students and the connections that I make. The pandemic has taught me to slow down, enjoy the little things and the silver linings in the classroom and in my life, and focus on the relationships with your students. If I could share one piece of advice with my students, it would be the willingness to go above and beyond is gonna take you really far in life, but also understand your capacity and what your boundaries are love yourself and love others and lead with kindness. And I take this recognition as an honor and a celebration of all teachers this year in our district and beyond. And I think the work that I've seen the teachers doing on my site across the district everywhere is amazing and every single teacher deserves to be recognized. She really uh, represents all teachers because what I see in Emily is what I see in teachers across our district. I don't think there's ever been a time where I have been more proud to be associated with educators and everything that teachers are doing to support the students and families. Emily gives all of herself to her school community. She is a leader when it comes to curriculum. She is a leader within her school site. She connects deeply with her students. She's always grasping for um, real world concepts into her elementary classroom. It's that warm, caring, personal attitude that she has that really draws her students into learning. 
Mr. Ashendorf shines as a teacher because he is very aware of his students' social emotional well-being in the moment in his classroom. Mr. Ashendorf has also gone above and beyond the call of duty. He champions students and when he finds a student has a need, he does everything he can to make that student's need fulfilled. Mr. Ashendorf goes above and beyond his responsibilities by always volunteering for things that are needed. Mr. Ashendorf was one of the first teachers to volunteer for our student-centered food drive. As a teacher, I truly enjoy working with each student. Uh, I've been very blessed that the school district, Newport Mesa, has allowed me to have a position of where I'm able to adjust to each student, not have students adjust to me. For one day a week online, uh, doing distance learning, I have found that exceedingly enjoyable and beneficial, not just for me, but for the students. The main piece of advice I offered when I was running factories was don't panic. The same rule applies to my students when I talk to them with kind of the variation of saying, no drama, let yourself develop, don't overreact, see yourself in the situation and nobody's perfect. Getting the secondary teacher of the year award meant a great deal to me because the effect it had quite frankly more on my wife and on people who know me. Uh, they know how involved I am. I'm involved in many, many things outside the school district and in the school district around education. Dennis Ashendorf, I would call an innovator. He's always thinking about creative ways on in how to engage students. He's always thinking of ways of how students can create um, various items, whether that is in engineering, whether that's utilizing technology. He's also just really engaged, whether that is in the worldly perspective, in a community perspective. He just finds his way of being engaged in every realm of the community. And it's a great honor to celebrate him as a teacher of the year because he's he gives so much of himself to his students, to his community, to his neighbors. And so he's just a well-deserving human being. Both Emily and Dennis are just great examples of how awesome all of the teachers are for Newport Mesa. Thank you, Tamron. Thank you for that wonderful uh, little video. And it was spot on what you said about both of these teachers being just outstanding representatives of our school district is, is absolutely true. So thank you for sharing them with us this evening. And we appreciate both of you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have our student board members re reports and Trustee Bartow, who works with the student board members uh, came up with the idea of what they would speak about tonight. And it is suggestions on what they and their peers might like to see before the end of the year as memorable school experiences. So we have three of our board members speaking tonight. Um, Madeline, Maddie McNamer will be taking the roll call vote and from Back Bay High School. So Maddie, oh, would Maddie. you like to start? Yes, hi, my name is Madeline McNamer. I represent Back Bay High School. First, I would like to say that Back Bay has been doing well. Grades are going up now that we have adjusted to our schedules and students feel more confident now. We are start. We have started some COVID safe clubs just not too long ago, and it became a huge hit for a lot of the kids at the school. We wanted the students to still feel connected through these hard times. So all in all, Back Bay is doing pretty well. I think something that the board could do for our students as we transfer to the end of the school year and the calming of COVID is to pay most attention to our seniors. Our seniors need a little bit more of normalcy to the end of their adolescence on the right note after 
all that we have been through for these past two years. I think the board should try their hardest to make COVID safe activities for these students that have worked so hard these past two years. I think the best thing the board could do to help make sure that these seniors get that little bit of normalcy would be to figure out a way to have a safe in-person graduation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maddie. Next, we have Brittany Ebergeni from Estancia High School. Hello. Um, so what I wanted to focus on for uh, um, this section was that I think that the district can go forward and dedicate some of the following time of the month to uh, make a smooth transition for the following year. A lot of us are wondering what the next school year is going to look like and the district providing a solid sense of that feeling of what it's going to be in terms of schedule and what the school environment is going to be like will provide uh, a lot of students ease and a sense of normalcy. Talking generally, a lot of students are happy right now with sports opening up and there's a lot of buzz about graduation and just kids want to know what's going on and what it'll look like and things like that. And so students just want to feel ready and prepared for this next upcoming school year as obviously with COVID, um, what's going on is that we were uncertain a lot of the time. We didn't know what the schedule was going to look like and there were a lot of changes. So I think moving forward, a lot of time in preparation would really provide students with a sense of calmness and readiness. And I think that's where we should put most of our time in right now. Um, and yeah, like Maddie said, um, seniors have been facing a lot th throughout this school year. So I think sort of focusing on them and being able to provide them um, sense of like social events such as graduation is really important and would help provide a sense of normalcy and end the school year off right. Thank you. And next we have Bailey Bogard from Newport Harbor High School. Hi everyone, I am Bailey Bogard with Newport Harbor High School. Um, after speaking to many students in ASB and especially seniors in regards to what we want from the district as a whole, um, I was able to really figure out that the students really just wanna be able to have COVID safe events. Um, and so I know there are certain regulations placed on what we can and cannot do at school. Um, and I just hope that the district can allow us to participate in events as long as they follow those regulations, um, as long as we're masked and COVID safe and spaced apart from each other. Um, seniors and all of the grades really just wanna be able to participate and see each other in person um, as best as we can with the regulations that we have. Um, and so that's it, thank you. Thank you, Bailey. And I think we all feel the way that, that you have expressed yourselves. Um, we are looking to senior activities. I think each of your principals and activity directors is considering options because we do want to make it memorable for our seniors. And as Brittany brought up, we also want to have a smooth transition into next year. So I think you'll be getting a lot more information on that as we move along. So thank you all and appreciate you just hanging in there this year. Trustee Bartow, did you want to make a comment? Yes, I just want to um, add from our meeting on Monday when I met with the, all the student board members that the ideas I heard echoed those of the three students who spoke. Um, and in addition, um, they expressed uh, that they felt like they were getting a handle on their schedule and they're looking forward to being back on campus as much as possible um, over as the, the majority felt that way. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Harbor Council PTA report, Lisa Bowler. Good evening, um, President Yelsey, Superintendent Lee Sung, trustees, um, cabinet, and guests. Um, PTA is marching along. We're still working on um, getting our officers elected for next year. And um, it's a little harder for some than others. I know um, with people not having made their decisions yet on whether they're coming back, it's hard to get the volunteers, but you know, we're working on it and we're not in panic mode yet. We still have a little bit of time to um, continue that. But um, you know, we're looking forward to the elementary anyway, are really excited about the um, starting back on the 21st full time for the little kids. And that's going to be super exciting. 
And if I can just say one personal note here, I want to just thank um, Leona Olson for her um, extremely positive and professional way she handled the calendar committee. She had, as you all know, a wide variety of people to deal with and get all of our opinions and everything, you know, just right. And I have, I've been on the calendar committee several times and it was so smooth and so well done. I just wanted to give her a shout out. And that ends my report. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Wow. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you for acknowledging Mrs. Olson. That's very, I'm sure very much appreciated by her and all of us realize the work she does. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And tonight we're very pleased to have a special report by our DLAC president, Carla Hernandez, and the school community facilitator, Jacqueline Gayton Alarcon. Buenas noches, Presidenta Jelsey, miembros de la Junta Directiva y Superintendente. Soy Carla Hernández, la Presidenta de DILAC y madre de un estudiante de la Escuela Victoria. Gracias por la oportunidad de compartir con ustedes esta noche. DILAC está formado por representantes de 26 escuelas y nos reunimos mensualmente y compartimos temas obligatorios por el Estado, así como temas generados por los padres. Este año hemos compartido temas muy interesantes tales como información oportuna sobre el camino a la resolución, sobre la manera de cómo dirigir a los maestros y al personal administrativo de las escuelas, la presentación con el Departamento de Servicios Estudiantiles sobre los procedimientos e intervenciones de las escuelas de asistencia escolar, las presentaciones con el Departamento de Salud referente al servicio de salud durante la pandemia del COVID-19 dentro de las escuelas del distrito. Una presentación sobre el aprendizaje híbrido en las escuelas primarias y secundarias. La presentación con el Departamento de Educación de Tecnología sobre las herramientas para usar el Zoom en la página web del distrito con recursos digitales para padres y estudiantes. Estoy agradecida de formar parte de la Junta Directiva de TILA porque como madre de familia he aprendido mucho sobre las medidas a tomar para brindar una mejor educación para mi hijo y ofrecer un mejor futuro a sí mismo. Estoy agradecida con la señora Jacqueline Gaitán y la señora Laura del Pash porque nos enseñan en cada junta que ser padre no es solo tener hijos, sino también saber educarlos. Gracias. Good evening, members of the board and cabinet. I am Jacqueline Gaitan, a school community facilitator. I have the pleasure of working with DLAC parents. I will be reading the report in English for Mrs. Hernandez. Good evening, President Jelsey, trustees, and superintendent. I am Carla Hernandez, DLAC president of parent and a parent of a A student at Victoria. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you tonight. The DELAC consists of representatives from 26 schools and we meet monthly. They are state mandated topics as well as topics generated by parents. This year, we have discussed very interesting topics such as timely information on the trail to resolution and how to begin to address our educators and administration. Presentation with the student services department regarding school attendance, procedures and interventions. A presentation with information and feedback regarding health services that were available at the school sites during the COVID-19 pandemic. Information was presented about hybrid learning in elementary and secondary schools. Information presented by the Education Technology Department regarding tools 
to utilize during Zoom meetings and how to access information on the district website with digital resources for parents and students. I am grateful to be part of the DLAC Board of Directors because as a parent, I have learned a lot about the steps it requires to provide a better education for my son and afford him the best future possible. Likewise, I am grateful to Mrs. Jacqueline Gaten and Mrs. Laura Delpash because they have continuously taught all parents not only the importance of our children, but also knowing how to educate them. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Carla Hernandez, DLAC President. Thank you. Thank you both, Ms. Hernandez and Ms. Alarcon. Um, and Trustee Anderson, I know you attend DLAC. Would you like to uh, give your observations? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm just so excited that we have this report. Thank you so much, Carla, for being here and for sharing your perspective. Um, I, I think it's just such a welcome opportunity. So thank you. And hopefully we'll be able to have you regularly. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you again, both of you for joining us. Um, and, Muchas gracias. Um, President of NMFT, Tamara Fairbanks, I know she did a presentation before, but would you like to discuss anything else that is happening with your association? Yes. Um, good evening, board trustees and honored guests. This weekend was our biannual CFT convention. This convention featured many of our legislators that have fought for our public school funding, as well as speakers that encouraged us to breathe life into our students and embrace the diversity within our schools. We had panels on anti-racism, had memorials for those leaders we've lost this year and set forth the professional standards that we are looking forward to in the future. One of the biggest takeaways was a level of professional and collegial respect that we had among colleagues. No matter your job title, our common thread is that we respected the expertise of each other. This is something that I love at the, I loved at the moment and wish that we can move forward with in New Port Mesa. We often discussed the emotion and excitement of upcoming plans without any reference to the expertise that we need to achieve it. We expect our teachers to work outside of their teaching duties, move furniture during the time they don't have, reconfigure curriculum they have, um, that they've taken weeks to develop and change IEP schedules in order to achieve compliance with very little expectation that upper management answers questions with the details of a plan. Leaders should seek out the expertise of their professionals at their work site. Professionals want to know if a risk assessment was done to determine the impact of our students. Professionals want to know why we are reducing minutes in RTI services. Professionals want to know details in order to help their students become successful. Professionals want to know if the school board will fulfill their promise of going back to 20 to 1 in an effort for school safety. Professionals do not like being told that they are lucky to have a job when they ask for questions of a plan that they were not invited to have input with. We cannot reconcile that we have set forth a plan that has not been approved, nor can we reconcile that NMUSD refuses to tell their employees about a plan they are forcing them to execute. We wish we had an employer that held themselves to the same professional ideals and expectations and accountability that they hold us. Thank you. CSEA President Pam Saunders, is she with us tonight? Yes, I'm here. Good evening, President Yelsey Ford, Superintendent Lee Sugg, Cabinet and guests. Thank you for this opportunity from CSEA. First and foremost, we'd like to thank all our classified employees throughout the district for all their hard work and dedication during the pandemic. Our positive impact is not done yet. We are very grateful to every classified employee for their hard work. CSEA has been an integral part in getting us where we are today and will continue to help to lead the way to educational normalcy. We would still like to continue the safety measures of all students and staff at schools and work sites with elementary returning in the spring and secondary in the fall with safety measures in place. CSEA wants to be part of the positive 
proactive planning process to ensure that classified members need and concerns are addressed prior to the opening. For the continuity of instruction and to provide peace of mind and safety for, for our employees, we ask the district to provide all staff and students the opportunity to be vaccinated before a change in our educational model is considered. There is a continued impact to our district workforce. This creates an unsafe environment for our students as the remaining staff is overworked, stressed, and scared. We'd like to remind everyone to continue to wear a mask and social distance. Again, thank you again for, for this opportunity, CSEA Chapter 18. Thank you very much. And again, we just all wanna show our appreciation to all our classified and certificated staffs who have done just a remarkable job throughout this whole year. We all know it hasn't been easy. So we thank you all for all the adjustments we've made and really what's do, what we're doing, which is in the best interest of all the students. So thank you again to all of you. Thank you. And next we are moving item 18A, which is approval, approved transition of elementary schools to level one beginning April 21st, 21. Up next, now we do have some input um, on this on this agendized item, and I know we have a report. So Trustee Matwaye, would you like to read? Certainly. Speakers wishing to address the board on special agenda topics have submitted the appropriate comment card on the district website by no later than 11 a.m. today, Tuesday, March 30th, 2021. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Thank you. And we have seven cards on this item. So um, we go 20 minutes and I think we should have about enough time. So Susan Fish, would you like to start calling the... Thank you, President Yelsey. The first comment card is from Sherry Sharp, although I do not see her in the list of attendees. So we'll move on to the next comment card, which is from Sarah Awater. And let me just click on her name. Sarah. Uh, yeah, good evening, can you hear me? Excuse me, you have three minutes, sorry, you have three minutes. Um, you are unmuted now. State your name for the meeting record and begin speaking. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. My name is Sarah Allwater. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Pomona Elementary. I'm concerned about how the decision came about to shift to full day in-person instruction in elementary schools. You've referenced teachers being excited several times, even to the point of indicating it was a rationale or qualification for going back with only 37 days remaining in the school year and without broad input from all teachers from all different sites. As professionals, we do not make decisions out of emotion. We make them based on quantifiable data, authentic input from stakeholders, and above all, what we can do successfully and safely during this pandemic. Teachers' excitement and enthusiasm when it comes to the well being of children is not the same as our professional judgment regarding what is best for students. As teachers, we have worked and prepared for our students harder and more than ever. We have spent many hours meeting parents, planning lessons, and learning new technology. As teachers, we are burning the candle at both ends. Now we are asked to spend many more hours making all new schedules, collaborating with specialists on those schedules for 37 days of school. I want to know that the school board is considering the well being of all employees, not just the ones that share opinions that are most closely aligned with yours or those in the community that threaten to enroll their children in private schools. I would compare the quality of our teachers and the successes that we have with our students to those in private schools any day, knowing that we will outperform them on every measurable level. There is no contest between what we provide over what is available in the marketplace. It is our understanding that while visiting one of our school sites, board members in response to frustrations that were voiced by teachers pointed out that we are quote, lucky to have our jobs. Having a job is always a blessing, obviously, but luck has nothing to do with it. Our teachers go through an enormous amount of preparation and education to work with students. 
Sadly, we have to constantly demonstrate our worth and the value that we bring to our community through our chosen profession. Teachers make tremendous sacrifices of their personal time, often away from families. As teachers, we spend a tremendous amount of our own money to provide resources to students. In response to the statement that we are lucky to have our jobs, I would say, well, I guess board members are lucky too. Lucky to be able to finance campaigns, lucky enough to have friends, including teachers who support them, and lucky enough to be entrusted by members of the public, including teachers, to perform a very vital role within our community. Please take this time as an opportunity to acknowledge that teachers have been working in person with students since September under exceptional conditions, exceptional learning conditions and working conditions and during COVID. So in the future, please don't talk to us about luck when we're only seeking to be prepared. And That's please minutes. use it as a tactic to silence us when we're trying to give input. Thank you. Our next speaker is from Tara Pang. You have three minutes. Please unmute yourself, state your name for the meeting record, and begin speaking. Tara, are you, I see your name here. Did you want to speak? Tara, if you want to speak, please unmute yourself. Okay, I guess we'll move on to the next speaker. That is, Excuse me just a second. Julie Means, you have three minutes. Please unmute yourself, state your name for the meeting record and begin speaking. Hi, this is Julie Means. I am the proud parent of a CDM high school student and she's a junior this year and I'm also the PTA president. First off, I want to say thank you to President Yelsey, Superintendent Lee Sung and the board for being audacious and planning on putting our elementary students back in school full time. I applaud you for doing so. And because I'm a parent and, a, and the PTA president, I have been getting a lot of comments from parents the past week, especially that they would like to see secondary students in person as well. I have communicated with President Yelsey about this, and I know she's gotten quite a few comments as well. And I know it's much more of a challenge, but I believe we have the resources and the ability to see our secondary students in school sooner rather than later. So I would just urge you and encourage you to do whatever is necessary to see that our middle school students and high school students are in person full time before the end of this school year. We have students that are seventh graders that have never gotten to have a full day on our campus. We have students that transferred in that also haven't been able to have a full day and a full week on our campuses. And I think this way we would be more prepared for in-person full-time in the fall. Um, also, I really want to see their seniors <clears throat> on campus. And I know that at CDM High School and the other schools, you have been pushing for sports and other activities and I applaud those efforts as well. As we go forward, if there's anything we can do as a PTA to help in these efforts, I would like to say that we would be willing to step forward and do so. So again, I just urge you and encourage you to get our students in the secondary level in school full time, full week, except for Mondays before the end of the school year. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janine Bashore. You have three minutes. Please un unmute yourself, state your name for the meeting record and begin speaking. Hi, this is Janine Bashore. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so Orange County will be moving to the moderate tier tomorrow and our positive case rates have been plummeting. Um, my understanding also is that our teachers have been vaccinated. 
what is Newport Mesa Unified School District doing to get our secondary students back on campus? I've heard that we need to have extra contract, contact tracing, safety issues, opening up classrooms with distancing guidelines, but it seems like this should have been planned out months ago. When will you guys, when will New, Newport Mesa Unified School District, we need you to be proactive with this versus reactive. We really need our kids back full time this school year. Um, there's a group of parents, we've been emailing you daily, I think. Um, we also have formed a, a group called Newport Mesa United Parents, and we've been collaborating with all the districts that are reopening. Um, you know, we're educa getting educated and we are also seeking your advocacy and next steps for our secondary students. We really need them back on campus this year, full time. Um, my questions are, you know, given the new CDPH guidance and only recommends three feet of spacing between students. What are you doing to expand the number of students on campus as soon as possible? And I mean secondary. You know, given the lack of restrictions between elementary and secondary schools, what are you doing to provide equal access to in-person instruction for all students in all grades? <clears throat> Finally, there's dozens, if not more, of large school districts from our surrounding areas that have figured this out and they've planned ahead and they're returning their secondary students four or five days on campus this year. A few of them include Placentia Yorba. They have an enrollment of 25,000 total and their secondaries are returning on April 19th. Saddleback Valley, they have 26,000 students total. They're returning their secondaries on 419. Chino Valley, enrollment of 30,000. Their secondaries, they're returning April 12th. And then Vista Unified down in San Diego County, 20,000 students, they're returning on April 5th. Parents are just really frustrated and we really want our children back on campus full-time this school year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Margaret Anderson. You have three minutes. Please unmute yourself, state your name for the meeting record and begin speaking. Hello everyone. My name is Margaret Anderson. Thank you for this time. Um, I have been a teacher in Newport Mesa for over 30 years, and every single one of those years have been at Whittier School. Um, I am here to ask you to seriously consider bringing bus transportation back to elementary schools. And obviously, I am especially wanting that at Whittier School. Um, now that we are moving into level one, we do have the parameters and the funding for bus service. Um, with the prospect of full class, full day instruction, um, we will see the arrival and dismissals, uh, the population coming to arrival and dismissal double. Um, during um, level two, our attendance and student safety were uh, significantly affected by not having bus transportation for students. We have seen some near misses on 18th Street involving car versus car, car versus student. Um, we have also had students miss the short time that they are in our classroom because there was not a dependable, safe way for them to get to school. Um, so once again, I would really, really, really ask you to seriously consider um, bringing busing to elementary school, especially now that we're going full day um, to support our families during this time. And thank you very much for your time. Have a great evening. Thank you. Our next, let's see, our next um, speaker is Carol Graves. Um, I have one Carol online, not sure if it's the right one. So Carol Graves, if this is you, would you please unmute yourself and state your name for the meeting record and begin speaking? Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Carol Graves. And my daughter in ninth grade is CDM. She has only been in in-person school for 30 days this year. And uh, so-called virtual learning is not effective. And I think Newport Mesa should implement a plan to get kids back into school full time. We know this can be done safely because we've seen it done in other places such as private schools and in other states and districts. And 
California in general and Newport Mesa in particular are in last place when it comes to implementing a plan to get kids back into the classroom full time. <clears throat> I speak not only about my daughter, but about many kids in her grade who have told me that they aren't learning nearly as much as they did compared to when they were in a classroom with a teacher. I think what you're doing by attempting to stick with the so-called virtual learning has never been tried before for this length of time. And it's basically experimenting with our kids in their future. Kids in middle school and high school are not college students. And it's misguided to try and treat them like they are. In addition to the overall picture being bleak for the kids whose education has been entrusted to you, there are many heartbreaking individual stories. I just learned a few weeks ago that in her classes, the school leadership at CDM is encouraging teachers to cut off the Zoom calls for virtual students so they can focus on the kids in front of them. That means that the kids who are so-called virtual learning don't get the full amount of class time. This also means that for my daughter who has an IEP, she doesn't have meaningful access to her aid when the Zoom call is cut short. And this has affected her grades more than once. There needs to be a plan for students in middle and high school and their families to resume in-person school full time. The untold damage that these kids will likely you know, experience will be long lasting. And every day that we continue with this schedule and this experiment of so-called virtual learning, you do more damage to these students. At this point, I think Newport Mesa has a responsibility to come up with some kind of plan to get these kids back in the classroom, in person, full time. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we're going to go back to the top of the list. Uh, Sherry Sharp has joined us now. Sherry, you have three minutes. Please unmute yourself, state your name for the meeting record and begin speaking. Okay, great. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, good evening. Thank you so much for listening. I'm surprised that the transition for secondary schools to level one was not on the agenda tonight. Districts in California, including Malibu, Santa Monica, Carlsbad, and throughout San Diego, among others, have all announced that K through 12 will be returning after spring break. I know that our board and superintendent are in support of all of our kids returning to school in person full time as soon as possible. Many teachers that I know have told me they want to be back full time and I know that several of my kids' teachers have told them that they want to go back. Parents overwhelmingly support live in classroom learning. The longer our children go without it, the more damage is being done to them socially, emotionally, and academically. So the elephant in the room to me is the teachers' union. I feel like there is a major disconnect and philosophical difference between their agenda and what our students need and deserve. We are at a point in time where everyone, I mean everyone, is back to work at their jobs. And it's up to all of us as individuals to make our own personal decisions. And, and I understand that teachers, you know, each one of them may feel differently as a person. I think it's time for our teachers as individuals to decide whether they will be returning to teach full time at school or not. If they don't want to return in spite of widely available vaccines, masks, and cleaning requirements, that is totally up to them. But that's where our children need to be. If we need to hire new teachers or aides to positions for those who don't want to come back, then let's start that process now. Please return our children to school now. Thank you. Thank you. President Yelsey, those are all the comment cards for this item on the agenda. Thank you, Susan, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, Superintendent Lee Sung, would you like to take over the presentation? All right, good evening, everybody. Um, we are here uh, to discuss a very important step that I'm excited to 
uh, share with the board and recommend that we move our elementary schools uh, to level one. And so I have a presentation that I'm gonna share with uh, Kathleen Leary, who is our director of early childhood education. So we're both gonna provide information to you uh, leading up to a recommendation uh, to approve this item. So here it is, item 18A, approve the transition of elementary schools to level one beginning on April 21st, 2021. I wanna go back to a couple of slides that I shared uh, several times uh, over many presentations dating all the way back to June of 2020. And this was one of the first slides that I created to really anchor us to uh, what is our guiding principles throughout this pandemic. And I keep going back to this because uh, this is what we have been uh, working towards as a district. And what's, uh, what's been a challenge in this environment is that every single one of these things is, is incredibly important to us. But many times in the decisions that we're making, we have to weigh and balance uh, each of these guiding principles and commitments. First of all, of course, maintaining that safe environment for our students, teachers, and staff. Uh, we have talked many, many times, I've heard all of our trustees emphasize the importance of the social emotional needs of our students. Uh, we've emphasized the relationships and connections, you know, particularly in a distance learning environment. Uh, we also have uh, talked about providing the best quality teaching and learning, regardless of what delivery method it is. Uh, and then to make sure that it's equitable. And I can go on and on, but these are the guiding principles that I believe uh, have um, challenged us, have kept our focus on what has been important uh, and knowing that, you know, things uh, many times it's a, it's one or the other or a balancing act, or sometimes there's pros and cons with every decision that we make. But I believe this has been a very important um, guiding document and principle for us as a district. Uh, I want to bring back this slide. If you recall this way back in June, this was a concept and it was uh, approved uh, on the, the board meeting on June 24th of 2020, where we uh, added a parent choice virtual learning option. But then uh, the next board meeting, we had talked about a three level adaptable plan. And just to kind of walk through a bit, we started the school year in distance learning as we know, back in August. And we were there, uh, we prepared for that. We created a, a stronger, better distance learning program than what we did in the, in the spring. Uh, but we quickly, as soon as our county was eligible to reopen in person, we moved to level two. And that was in the end of September. Uh, we had to uh, stagger our start. So we waited to bring back secondary, which we ended up doing in early November. But we got all of our students in schools to level two. Uh, then uh, we are now, I'm sorry, let me go back to one piece. Uh, we did move our secondary schools to distance learning for a three week period. And that was to make sure that we can survive the surge, which absolutely occurred in our community in our county and everywhere throughout our state. But we were able to do that. We fulfilled our commitment to bring secondary back after that three week period. So they have been in hybrid ever since. So now we're at the next step. And this is exciting to be able to recommend uh, to the board for approval that we bring our elementary schools to level one where they are in person for full days, going back to our original schedule pre-COVID. So this is the three level plan that we are actually seeing play out in reality. So there's a few questions that I want to uh, respond to, kind of in a Q&A format. And many of these questions are in a Q&A FAQ that is on our website. But the first question is why? Why are we doing this? And the board has stayed true to our commitment to bring our students back as soon as possible and in a safe environment. And we believe we are at that stage right now. Even though the hybrid, um, you know, we have done the best that we could in this setting. Uh, we know that having kids in person is the ideal uh, setting. So we've stayed true to that, that uh, guiding principle. So why now? The first thing is our COVID rates have consistently been declining. 
even as of today, I have checked the numbers and we are now uh, going to be moving to the orange tier. So that's really great news, really great news that we continue to move in that direction. There was also a significant change in the California Department of Public Health guidance that was updated uh, first in, on January 14th, but more critically as recent as March 20th, just 10 days ago uh, on the uh, social distancing requirement and in the classroom. And the third significant change uh, that makes this possible is the fact that we have uh, uh, been eligible for vaccinations in the education sector. And many of our staff, many of us have received either our first dose or some of us even our second dose. So that is progressing very quickly. So all of these elements makes this very possible and leading up to this recommendation. So the next question is, when will this begin? And as stated in the agenda item, that we are proposing to start elementaries in uh, level one on Wednesday, April 24th. That is uh, after spring break. 21st. April 21st. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just want to make sure you're all still with me. <laughs> Wednesday, April 21st, which is uh, two days after our spring break um, ends. And what is the schedule for level one for elementary? And we are planning uh, to have a return back to the old schedule pre-COVID when the 2019-20 school year with the same start and end times. So we're returning back to uh, those schedules. And another important question is what are the safety protocols? And I want to remind everybody that this is our guiding document here as a as a school in California, uh, that uh, all of our public schools uh, need to follow this uh, guidance. And like I say, it was uh, uh, issued on January 14th, but last updated just recently on March 20th. So this is our guiding document. And based on that, we implemented many, many safety guidelines. And this is an updated slide, uh, something I've shared before, but I updated it with the recent uh, items that we have, but first of all, face coverings are required. They're still going to be required. As long as the California Department of Public Health requires that for our district, we must follow that. And the only exceptions are those allowable reasons under the state guidance. Okay, we continue to do the passive wellness screening and visual health checks, obviously maintaining the social distancing and maintaining stable groups. Here's a key one, maximizing space in classroom between seats and desks, but no less than three feet. This is per the uh, CDPH guidance that was amended shortly after, in fact, record-breaking <laughs> change uh, after one day after the CDC had uh, changed their guidance. We continue to have signage and directional traffic patterns on campus, clean, increased cleaning and disinfecting the healthy habits and hand washing, all of these things may uh, continue to be uh, important. Uh, we are still limiting non-essential visitors on campus. We have clear plastic barriers in all of our elementary classrooms between students. We've increased the ventilation schedule uh, in all of our classrooms and we've increased our filtration standards. And the other thing that I'm very proud that we did as a district was we purchase a HEPA air cleaner for all of our classrooms, okay? So this is just a partial list, but many things that help keep our students and staff safe. Now I'm gonna turn it over to um, Kathleen Leary, who has been a really instrumental leader in working with a committee, working with our principals uh, to work out all the logistics and the details to make this happen. So Kathleen Leary. Good evening, uh, members of the board, cabinet and community members. Um, I wanted to start by thanking our committee. Uh, this committee who uh, included Amy Nagy, uh, Ara Zorensny, Christy Flores, Carrie Adams, Kristen Clark, Kurt Sir, Stacy DeBoom Howard and Tiffany Lewis. And they have worked tirelessly um, to help with coming up with some parameters and recommendations. But 
they met with me probably daily at times, and they worked really hard to uh, ensure the safety of our school while at the same time allowing us to open. And even though they're not on this slide, I also want to shout out to um, some of the other people who've been working really closely with the committee. Uh, Megan Brown um, from HR, Lance Bidnick from MO, Jonathan Wilby, our risk manager. Awesome Babovich, IT, Jonathan Geisler from Purchasing, our student services, um, Sarah Coley and Kristen Henry. And I also want to thank um, our special lead specialists, Diana Thompson, Ryan Baker, and Bridget Duffin, who've met with me a few times so we can discuss specialists and uh, classroom setup, as well as parameters and recommendations, so that we're also including our music, PE, and science when we're talking about opening safely. Can I, next slide, please. So um, Russell talked about the guidance from the California Department of Public Health. And we really took the, the guidance with the help of Jonathan Wilby, who helped us you know, dissect all of it so that we could come up with some parameters. And some of the main areas that we really uh, looked at because we knew they were going to be impacted uh, by some of the safety measures were things like the arrival dismissal, lunch recess, special ed, RTI, and social emotional learning and PBIS. The other thing was facilities. We really would analyze classroom spaces to make sure that we were maximizing that space for seating um, and not no less than three feet. And we wanted to see how many teachers we needed to hire. Um, and going out to classrooms enabled us to not only look at the square footage, but the enrollment and the class setup to see how we can safely seat students. Um, based on the parameters, we created some subcommittees. And in the subcommittees, we created recommendations so that school sites would have a basis to carry out these parameters. Next slide, please. So as you can see, um, we did have the subcommittee work. All principals were involved in one of these committees. And um, one of the recommendations was for them to replicate these or some that were similar back at their site so that we could, they could have teachers and classified staff input on their reopening plans for the school sites. I want to share a couple of the um, just main um, some recommendations and areas of focus. So if I could have the next slide, please. Um, one, we know that the social emotional learning of our students is critical. Um, during this time, students may have felt disconnected. We want to bring them back and create a classroom community. Um, like I mentioned, Sarah Coley and Kristen Henry have developed structures for teachers to build those um, communities during, through some daily activities. Um, we also want to build friendships. We know that our students in the AM might not know the students in the PM. So it's really important that we take some time to develop those uh, relationships and community. Um, next is really developing the clear behavior expectations. Uh, we, that's through PBIS, and they have been uh, pivotal in giving us some language we can use in our matrices because you know, what it looks like may be a little bit different because we have students wearing masks and having to social distance. So we're just tweaking those a little bit so that it would um, fit the school as well as uh, our COVID times. And lastly, we want to build scholarly stamina. On the next slide, please. Um, lunch and recess, I wanted to give you some updates about what it will look like. This is something that students have not had the opportunity. They had the grab and go home lunch before. We were gonna continue to provide a grab and go lunch for students who um, would like it. Um, however, we will be sitting and eating on um, at the lunch tables and outside. That is, something is very clear from the guidance is that uh, they recommend that we be eating outside, but six feet of social distancing. 
Another thing at lunch and recess, we want students to be grouped in various centers based on stable groups. And we've designed or principals are in the process of designing centers um, that students would then rotate throughout the week. Um, and we've been ordering playground equipment. Uh, we've ordered some fitness activity circuit stencils that will be um, painted onto the blacktops. Um, and really the other part is that students have not been able to use the playground equipment, so they will be able to use the playground equipment as well. And so parents and teachers, or sorry, principals and teachers are busy at work designing some of the structure. We've had to adjust some of the lunch and recess schedules just so that we can make sure that all students are safe and that we have appropriate supervision outside to make sure that students are socially distanced and, and um, playing in, the, in their designated centers. Um, the next slide, please. The last thing is that I just wanted to let you know that after um, a lot of analysis, uh, we are hiring approximately 10 new teachers so that we can make sure class sizes are a little bit smaller with those classes that were um, a, a little bigger. And we really adhere to the most current CDPH guidance, maximizing that space between seating and desks. Um, and we looked at six feet versus five feet versus four feet and really maximizing. So even if um, we had, you know, we had students, say 16 or 17 students in class, we would be recommending that they would be spreading out at least six feet and maximizing that space. In addition, we are in, uh, ensuring that there's the teacher space to allow adequate space for teachers to ensure safe physical distancing from students as well as other adults in the classroom. And I know that this might require some um, desks going into classrooms as well as moving some furniture and storage and working really uh, closely with m &O to create a schedule. Um, and uh, principals have developed some maps that they will be giving to m &O that during spring break, the moving of furniture as well as storage will be occurring for those sites that need it. I wanna thank uh, Kathleen for uh, not only the presentation tonight, but all of the incredible detailed work that she is doing, uh, supporting our principals, supporting these committees. And it's amazing every challenge that has come up, uh, they are finding solutions and every day we're working closer and closer to the final uh, plans. So a couple more questions I just wanna uh, share with the, with the trustees tonight is will bus transportation continue? And the answer is yes, we're gonna maintain our current routes uh, with the current safety protocols. So those will uh, continue moving to level one. Um, can you check with Dr. Chow in your Friday superintendent's meeting and see if once we get to orange, if there's been any kind of accommodation or relaxing of the rules so that we may be able to get more kids on the bus. I know that we have one child per bus per seat, one child per seat, not one child per bus, one child, which, you know, the limos that we're sending out, one child per seat. And that's what's limited us and where we can go. And if there's any kind of accommodation that can be made, we'd be happy to help out transportation to get that done. So if you can ask, I'd appreciate yes, it. Yes, I will certainly check if there's any change forthcoming in the guidance for transportation. Uh, currently our standard is everyone wears masks and everybody is one per seat other than household members, they can share a seat together. If I may also echo that. Um, we have sports that are pretty close contact and they're allowed to be participating with each other. So I would like to ask that with masks, we are allowed to have two kids per, per seat. And if that is not possible, if we can charter buses, we do that for sports. It is an equity and access issue for our children to be able to come to school. Currently, it is not working well. 
Um, there are a lot of students who are not able to come for the hybrid and they're not going to be able to come for a full day. Um, I also, I'm not sure if people have looked recently at the boundaries for a school like Wilson that go all the way to nearly Triangle Square. So if a child, we have children who the current boundary is 1.5 miles. It is morally unacceptable for a first grader to walk 1.5 miles by themselves. I would really like to suggest that we make an adjustment. Thank you. Thank you for your input. I will look Thank into you. that. Next is, will secondary schools transition to level one? And I know we've had uh, <laughs> many public comments, a lot of emails on this key question. And I do wanna share um, three points here. So first of all, the, the direction and the commitment is clear that we do wanna get all of our kids back to full time as much as, as we can. So we are working very diligently on this. We've had many deep discussions with our site principals who know their schools, know the challenges and, uh, and or we're, we're working to support that. Uh, I'm not to the point where I can say that we will do that. I wish I could, but there's still a lot of discussion uh, to have. Uh, you heard an example of elementary and all the details that go into making that work. You can imagine in a, a high school or a middle school, uh, that level of planning uh, and complexity is even greater. And I wanted to give just a few examples of that. Uh, when we're talking about um, combining cohorts and having all of our kids uh, come to school, well, we're talking hundreds, if not thousands of students coming back to campus. And we have to make sure that there's adequate space. Even the three foot um, uh, distancing flexibility, that, that's a great change. We're very, very pleased about that. But even in, in with three feet, uh, we are not gonna be able to hit, fit all of our kids in every single classroom. Um, if you understand um, how high schools work, there are electives, there are certain specialized programs and classes that have a large number of students. And, and, and there's also instructional spaces that are unique to those programs. So that's the type of analysis that's going on right now to see that we can do that. And then also in a middle school and a high school, the schedules, the master schedule is very complex. It's not a matter of just adding a teacher and rearranging the master schedule. So there's some challenges and complexities with that. All of the operations, not just in the classroom, but outside the classroom, between classrooms, uh, lunch, uh, passing periods, all of that uh, poses this challenge. And then plus the transportation. So we're looking at all of these things and I wanna be able to report to the board, report to the public uh, that if we can do this, we certainly wanna do this sooner than later. So these conversations I wanna assure you are happening with our principals and will extend to others as appropriate. So uh, hopefully uh, I'll be able to make uh, some uh, announcements uh, very soon. Uh, the last question is, will the fall be full day, full time for elementary and secondary? And yes. as I had announced in a previous message that we do intend to provide full day instruction for all of our students TK-12 uh, for the fall. And the only exception is if the county or the state prohibits us from doing that. I think in this environment for them to prohibit that would be a very difficult decision on their part. Uh, so we uh, will be making plans to open up the fall also in a full day model. Okay, so uh, I just wanna say uh, in closing that uh, with the approval tonight uh, from our board, uh, we will start to share site specific details with our parents. Uh, might start a little general at first, but as we get closer to the start date, that those details will get more specific uh, and more detailed at each particular school site. And finally, uh, we do recommend the approval of this item, which is to transition our elementary schools uh, to level one beginning on April 21st. Thank you. Okay, and just one comment, I just to clarify, there will be no students on Zoom, correct? In elementary. In that, elementary. That's correct. With this, with this model, uh, it is a full day model. Uh, so they're all in person. There is no zooming um, in this full day model. Okay. Trustee Wagon. 
Yes, thank you so much for uh, this detailed plan. Yeah, and Kathleen Larry, thank seconds. you so much for everything that you've done to get our um, elementary schools back in person. I know a lot of parents are very excited about the return to in-person, so I thank you. Um, just wanted to ask a couple questions about secondary. I know we all really want secondary to be back, and I know that it's a big um, feat for us to uh, work on getting secondary back, but I wanted to see, um, you know, I think the, the community wants to know exactly what are we doing to get them back? What have conversations have we had? What kind of transparency? They just want transparency and what we are doing to get our secondary back. I think we have a lot of communications with the, the public about what we're doing, but I think sometimes it, it, it sounds better when it's coming from district leaders to um, tell them, you know, what is actually going on. So if you can be a little bit more detailed specific on, you know, what we're doing, um, what our hopes are, and that we're not gonna, you know, just leave them hanging, that we really do want secondary back in person. Yes, yeah, so it, what I shared with you, uh, it starts with our principals. We all know our principals are the site leaders who know uh, their schools. And so quite frankly, the first thing we need to do is make sure and hear from them through these deep analyses that this is even possible. Uh, is a full uh, return to level one possible or is there something else uh, short of that? So we're looking at all of these kinds of options. Okay, we're also hearing uh, that other districts uh, are slowly starting to make announcements that they're returning. Of course, we're also looking at what they might be doing. Uh, so, you know, all of these things are helping us in our uh, preparations. And when I get to the point to know that not just the site principals, but all the support and the operations that goes into running a school can happen, I would be very proud to make that announcement. Uh, so, you know, the details are all of these things that uh, we talked about, the space, the, uh, uh, the operations, does this change how we move from class to class? What happens at lunchtime? How do we get kids on and off? Can we transport kids, et cetera, et cetera. So there's uh, all of these deep level discussions that are occurring right now. That was an important question, so I didn't want to interrupt, but could we move and second and then have the discussion? Uh, normally we would move and point of order point of order we would move second and then have our discussion about these questions um sure okay, okay. we're on the agenda item so okay. do i have a motion i to move order? approval <laughs> and of second. transitioning elementary school to level one beginning april 21st um a second okay trustee mortoyer uh, recommended the approval and trustee crane seconded it and we will continue with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Trustee Crane. Yes, I had a, I was gonna piggyback off of uh, Trustee Weigand's comments. Um, time is ticking. And I do know that I'm sure you're aware of that. So do you think that we could give our community a little more information within the next week or two before spring break or just so that we have some expectation because time is ticking? Yes, absolutely. And I, and I recognize that we all recognize there's urgency to make a decision, uh, not only to let our parent community know, but more importantly, our staff. Thank you. If they have absolutely. to make adjustments, they're going to need time uh, to make that happen. So absolutely, uh, within the next two weeks before spring break. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate the work. We know it's a, there's a, it's a lot. Um, do I, I have any other comments? I had a question. I had a yes. question about level one and then a question, I'm sorry, about elementary and then about secondary. Um, for elementary, so since there will be no Zooming, um, will there be some sort of secondary work take-home plan developed at the sites? Has that been discussed for students who uh, might have been exposed to COVID through a parent who uh, might be to have contact tracing issues or just as used to happen as are generally sick. Do we have any kind of, have the sites discussed any kind of way that will handle uh, take home work for, for those students? So just like back in the old days. If you remember. <laughs> yeah. Last year, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is something that uh, teachers do need to provide uh, work for kids who are sick at home and uh, will continue the instructional program. Um, so I wanna ask if Kathleen Leary, did you want to add to that? I know you you folks have been having a lot of deep discussions. That is one thing that we are continuing our discussions about and trying to find uh, the appropriate 
uh, person to actually make the contact with the students because we know there will be some students that will be quarantined for you know a fair bit amount of time so we want them to continue to have that contact with school along with the work um, and maybe if they have any questions someone that they can ask um, to help them with some of the work so we are working on that and we will get you a answer to that um, very soon thank you and I just wanted to comment, I'm, I'm personally encouraged uh, by hearing that we're having these conversations about secondary and thank you for doing that work. And just wanted to thank you for um, being willing to look at other districts and work with our staff and our principals to, to make that happen. I know that's really important for a lot of secondary kids. Um, I wanted to thank Mrs. Larry, Ms. Larry, uh, particularly I've heard nothing but good comments from the um, people that have been on her committee and and those that have been on the subcommittees and the format that was used by making sure that the entire district was represented and then every single administrator at the school sites who also had subcommittees of professionals at their sites so they had the teachers at their own sites are working together to create the plans for returning and how it's going to work best it was comforting to hear that MNO is gonna come in and move the furniture. Of course, the teachers need to make their own little map, but um, that everyone was involved in making this happen. And I think that's that's such a good plan. And, um, and that was the comment that I heard. Oh my gosh, Ms. Leary did an amazing job of leading us and supporting us to make this happen. And and I would agree with Trustee Matoya's comments. I've been out to quite a few schools and everyone appreciates the involvement of not only the committee that has been working since last early November, I mm -hmm. believe, the immediate committee, but every single elementary principal has been, in, been on, served on one of those committees. So they have all participated in this and each of them are working as many of us have seen within their campuses to really create an environment that will work at the individual schools. And one of the comments that I've heard from various principals is it's great we're coming back in the spring because I'm not making the decisions by myself. I have the staff here, we can go through the right. rooms and look at each individual room. Where if we had done this just in the summer, the principal giving his staff the time well-deserved time off uh, would not want to interrupt them and bring them in. So he or she would be on the campus making those de decisions uh, alone. So it really is nice that they're all collaborating on their sites. And again, to echo in secondary, I think we've all wanted secondary to be included in this for a long time. Um, we know it's more difficult, but I think it's very encouraging that there's constant conversations going on pretty much on a daily basis right now. <laughs> so um, we hope something positive will come out of that very soon. I'm optimistic. And also a kudos to principals who also reach out to their staff. That's know, what I, yeah. The classified yeah. and the teachers and worked collaboratively and then reported <clears throat> to the committee. So um, excellent job, everyone. Group effort. Anyway, if there are there any other questions or comments? If not, the motion was approved by tr Trustee Matwaye, seconded by Trustee Crane. And the motion is to approve transition of elementary schools to level one beginning April 21st, 2021. Roll call vote, Rosie. Student board member, Maddie McNamer. Yes. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. Trustee Bartow. Yes. Trustee Matoye. Yes. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Okay, so we are back on track and we um, finished community input on agenda agendized items. Next, we'll move to superintendent comments. Uh, Mr. Lisa, do you have additional comments to make? I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, there's more. Never pass up an, <laughs> never pass up an opportunity. Absolutely, <laughs> I can't. All right. So first of all, I, I just want to acknowledge and recognize uh, three of our teachers that were recognized tonight. Uh, it's, it's always great. We, we know we have amazing teachers here in this district. And when we can honor three of, of our top 
um, it, it's great. And, and you know, I, I, I kind of miss that in our board meetings, I is having so. people here and their family and friends and colleagues and all of that. And I, I wish we'll, we'll get to that point sooner than later. But the, but the recognition and the gratitude that we have for uh, Shelly Myman and Emily Matthews and Dennis Ashendorf uh, are heartfelt and, and uh, as it always has been in these recognitions. And I also wanna uh, recognize Annette Franco and Adriana Angulo who created that video. Um, you know, uh, amazing work there. They've been doing a lot of videos mm -hmm. lately, you know, <laughs> a lot of videos and they've made me do a few. And so uh, we, we recognize that's a great way to get the word out and share what, what's going on. Okay, and um, I know a real important question to our trustees, to our parent community is what's happening with graduation. So I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Baumeister to come up and give an update on our graduation planning and what has been really instrumental to allow us to get to this point where we can share this in public is the fact that the state did recently come out with guidance on this, which is very important. And we know what rules we have to follow. And if we know them, we're gonna find a way to make it happen. So Dr. Baumarsh, would you give us a, an update on graduation? Yes, thank you, Super Superintendent Leeson. As you know, early college and step will be kick, kicking off our graduation promotion season this year on Thursday, June 3rd. Our middle schools in the cloud will hold their ceremonies on Wednesday, June 9th, and our high schools will be graduating on Thursday, June 10th. In meeting with principals, assistant principals who run graduations and promotions, and athletic and activities directors who have been speaking with their students, the theme for this year's graduation promotion is really a return to normalcy, as you heard in Maddie's comments. <laughs> Our students want a traditional cap and gown in stadium graduation promotion. Though we know it will have to be socially distanced with masks, the students still wanna hear their names called, walk and get their diplomas, have student speeches, band and choir performances, and have their board member accept the class. The only difference in the graduation promotion ceremonies will be in the number of guests allowed to attend. If we remain in the orange tier, that it sounds like we're going to shortly, two guests per graduate will be allowed. If we make it to the yellow tier, four guests per graduate will be allowed at the ceremony. And since not everyone who wants to attend the ceremony will be able to go, the district will provide a live streaming service for people at home to watch the ceremony, see their graduates name called and receive their diploma. A communication from the district and from the schools with these date details, as long as the date, time and locations will be coming out shortly. Yay. All right, thank you, Dr. Baumeister. Good news. I, I had news. <laughs> I, I had just a quick question. Um, in regards to um, on-campus events and um, grad night, will we, be, are we, will we be expecting any guidance from the state regarding those things or will we be needing to come up with our own guidance based on what was from graduation? Right, so, so those events, um, we're gonna have to look at each of those kind of a case-by-case -case basis because there's some guidance that's out now regarding live events. Okay. There's also guidance related to amusement parks. So if a grad night, for example, is at an amusement park, there's a different set of guidance. Uh, but I will share with you the same level of discussions with our principals, our APs, our activities directors is going on as well. So we hope little by little to be able to make announcements with that. But there's different guidance and depending on what type of uh, event that is. And thank you, and that's really great news. Sorry, I didn't mean to detract from what wonderful news that is, thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, the next thing I wanted to, to make some comments on is something that's very important, I, I know, to all of us. Uh, we know that recently there's been a lot of attention on acts of violence against uh, Asians. Uh, but I don't wanna make this just about Asians, it's really about just violence in general and based on uh, hate or racism or anything like that. And I just wanna say that I know as a district, uh, we stand together in condemning all of these types of acts of violence and hate, whether it's based on race, gender, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, whatever it may be. 
we did some incredible work and have continued to do incredible work in this district in the area of human relations. And I think all of that has gotten overshadowed by all the, the COVID stuff that we've been um, uh, dealing with. But I wanna say that our district, I know continues to be committed um, to support all of our students and to have this culture and climate here in the district at all of our schools of inclusivity and of kindness. And these activities are continuing, are continuing. We have a human relations task force that continues to meet. There are activities that are happening. In fact, Dr. Baumeister is gonna share a couple of examples, recent examples of that in his informal report at the, uh, towards the end of the meeting. So I, I just wanted to st say that uh, and assure our board, our public, that these activities are continuing. It's just being overshadowed right now. And we hope to be able to highlight more of that and really to take that to the next level. Okay, so, um, so that was something that I thought was important for me to speak to. And the last thing is with all of this great news about our county moving to orange, our numbers coming down, athletics opening up, performing arts starting to perform under new guidance that was just created. All of these great things, including vaccinations, we can't relax. We can't relax with wearing masks, with the social distancing and all the guidelines, because the last thing we want is for things to start going back up and all of a sudden, some of the things that we're starting to get back to normal is gonna go in the wrong direction. So I just wanna assure or uh, recommend and encourage everybody to please, let's be diligent, let's not relax, let's enjoy all these new freedoms and back to normalcy, but not um, go backwards. That concludes my comments for tonight. Thank you, Superintendent Lee Sung. I think we all share your concerns and desires for things to keep improving, so. Onward we will go. Um, next we have consent calendar. Our, yes. Do I have a motion? We don't have any comments. Do I, I, I move we approve the consent calendar. Second. Who was the second? Krista. I'm sorry. It's so hard to see without <laughs> masks where it is. Um, moved by Trustee Matoye, seconded by Trustee Wigan. Are there any comments on anything? I just wanted to bring up the ones I had specific questions on and thank um, the, the staff for their answers. Um, I had some questions on Schoology because I know it's not widely used at sites and it sounds like um, we're gonna be doing some training so that that's more accessible to all school sites. So I'm very glad to hear that. And um, thanks for that clarification. Thank you. Okay, consent calendar, uh, roll call vote. Rosie. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. Trustee Barto. Yes. Trustee Matoya. Yes. Trustee Anderson. No. Trustee Crean. Yes. Trustee Wigan. Yes. Now we'll move on to item 18B on discussion action. Approve the agreement with school links for Newport Mesa Unified School District. Um, Mr. Drake. Yes, thank you. I'll do a brief introduction and then turn it over to uh, Mr. Boston here. Uh, but I'm going to need to take you back to the fall of 2019, um, which was quite a long time ago when uh, a decision was made for us just to start looking at uh, and go through a process to look at some college and career readiness platforms. Uh, currently, and even then, and for several years, we've been using uh, Naviance as our platform and it was time to just make sure that that was still the correct platform. At the time, Gabe Del Real, who's now principal at Harborview was our coordinator of uh, TK through 12th grade curriculum instruction. And so Gabe, along with um, Carrie Smith, one of our counselors who was at the time uh, our COSA, uh, developed a process very similar to the process we use to adopt uh, textbooks. Um, instructional materials. And they went through a process with counselors from every site, uh, as well as some principals to really analyze uh, the different op op options out there for uh, platforms. Uh, and around, I'm gonna say March 9th or 10th, um, uh, they, they came to a conclusion that school links uh, was going to be uh, the recommendation. Um, and I want them to share some of that. I, I bring up that March date because it was about four days later 
uh, that um, you know we we entered into kind of a new world in education. Um, but excited to uh, have this before you this evening, uh, uh, and want to uh, turn it on over to Michael Vossen uh, to take us through um, some more about school links. All right. Well, thanks, Mr. Drake, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, the item we have on the table for you tonight is a proposal for a new college and career planning platform called School Links. And Mr. Drake did a very nice job in introducing this. Uh, so I'll try to avoid some overlaps uh, in, my, in my intro here. But while my office was recently assigned the task of examining the feasibility and implementation of the program, there was significant legwork conducted prior to this by a team of individuals led by Carrie Smith, who is joining us tonight. Now, now Carrie is serving as a counselor at Estancia High School right now, but she also served previously as a counselor on special assignment for the district for five and a half years and came into that position with a wealth of knowledge and experience um, in the counseling trenches, if you will. And uh, one of the many projects Carrie took on for our district while she served um, as a COSA uh, was the examination of college and career planning software. And Carrie's gonna speak to the need for this program as well as to the process that was followed and bringing it forward for consideration. And also joining me tonight is Lisa Snowden, who is the counseling coordinator for our Office of College and Career. And Lisa has been a wonderful addition for our office and for our district. And she's going to discuss the implementation plan for the program. So with that, uh, Carrie Smith, uh, please go right ahead. Hello, thank you, Michael. Um, it's good to be here tonight and see everybody's faces or some of people's faces anyway. Um, so yes, we started this process actually a few years ago, um, looking into uh, you know, the engagement that we had with Naviance um, and noticing that our family engagement and actually our student engagement wasn't as high as we would like it. Um, counselors were also um, having uh, some complaints about how it was working for them and um, the, a lot of the engagement for the students was coming only when counselors were going into classrooms and doing actual activities with them. So we were looking to see if Naviance was still actually the platform that um, was suiting our needs or if we needed to look at other options. Um, and we did decide to look at a few options and include Naviance in that. Um, so we looked at four different options. Two of them fell out pretty easily because they either removed themselves because they couldn't um, work with enough colleges um, and or uh, other things like that. So we ended up evaluating both Naviance and School Links. Um, and it was a lengthy process. We started in November of 2019. And there was a uh, council representative from each secondary site, um, both middle school and high school. Um, and uh, then we also talked to students and had them evaluate um, both using a demo account in School Links as well as using Naviance. And they gave us their um, feedback and we looked at the evaluation data from the committee as well as the evaluation data from the students and we used all of that data on our consensus day um, and really looked at was Naviance going to meet our needs or did we want to go with school links at the end of the consensus day it was a, a majority um, pretty much almost everyone i believe came everyone came to agreement that we wanted to move to school links and that was actually on march 5th um, and we plan to go to the board to get approval from the board, um, I believe at the end of March or April. And wow, that pandemic really messed that plan up. Um, and I do know I have talked with counselors since um, and they are very excited. And we did meet with principals um, and assistant principals recently and they're very excited um, to move forward. So I know Lisa has some information to share with you regarding that. Thank you so much, uh, Carrie. And it's nice to see everyone this evening. Um, so I'll kind of pick it up from here. <clears throat> so given all that's going on, we were asked to conduct a feasibility study to determine if we could actually continue to move forward with School Links. And so we met with School Links and we had our director of IT and director of ed tech to identify what the technical setup would be, which would then determine what sort of staff support we would need and what our training timeline would look like. 
we discovered that school links integrates with class links. So the rostering and the data migration can happen fairly quickly and easily. And school links handles all training and they offer three different methods for training. They have some online self-paced modules. As part of the contract, they offer up to nine hours of staff training with office hours support and they have ongoing webinars. And getting, um, having Carrie kind of provide her counselor's perspective on this kind of training need, she identified that it would be really helpful if we could get counselors trained in the spring, this spring, so that they can then train the rising seniors on the application manager. So that when we fully implemented this in the 21-22 school year, those now seniors would be really ready to hit the ground running during application season. So we took that training timeline and we uh, met with uh, principals and counselors as Carrie had mentioned, and we kind of reminded them of this whole process, just like we're kind of doing uh, with everyone here tonight. And then we proposed our training timeline and we got a thumbs up from everyone. So uh, once we received that, those thumbs ups, we figured it was, you know, we felt confident to bring this item to board for your consideration. So pending board approval, our implementation timeline is that we would train our secondary counselors on the platform in April. Then our high school counselors would be trained on the application manager so they can then train their rising seniors. We do have a group of early, adoptering, uh, early adopters. We have some AVID teachers that are gonna join um, some spring training as well. And then our plan would be once we fully implement the starting next year, um, is to get you know, our teachers, um, our CTE teachers, and then our remaining teachers trained. So really our plan is to partner with School Links to create a comprehensive scope and sequence of activities to support meaningful and relevant use of this new college and career readiness tool for students in grades seven through 12. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Everybody's ears are clean. Thank you so much for your presentation. I had a question regarding, um, we've used Naviance for so long and the children and students work and put things into Naviance that accumulate. Is there a seamless transition? We, I would hate to think that they would have concerns of, oh my gosh, they changed it and I've lost everything. Yes, um, so they have a, they provide data migration um, and the rostering through class link. So we sh that's a very easy process and all of the student work should easily migrate over to the new platform. And I wanted to add to that, um, Trustee Matoye, that one of our first discussions for implementation was with Awesome and IT because that was the question you're asking was one of the first questions that we had regarding the implementation. So, um, so Lisa is spot on in, in, in that response. So when I move stuff and lose it, it's because it didn't migrate. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Trustee Matwai, before we take other comments, can we have a motion and a second? Oh, certainly. And then we can yeah. have questions and discussion. Would anyone else like to move? So I know moved. you were very eager. Go ahead. I'll move. Oh, move trustee, to approve the agreement with school Trustee Bartow moves. For Newport Mesa Unified School District. Second. Okay. It's moved by Trustee Bartow, seconded by Trustee Wigan. Now we can get further comments. Trustee Crane. Yes, hi. So um, from a parent of three children who've used Naviance, uh, um, I, I have some questions. Um, the data migration question was answered, uh, but uh, when it comes to the reputation of school links as far as uh, software support and integration, and when you're doing all the migration, does Naviance, how, have you thought about how Naviance translates into school links? Have you reached out to any districts who have made that transition and what, did, what were their comments? And then secondly, as far as timeline, would that transition be happening June to August or because of the, 
the data that is transferring for the student, mm -hmm. the, the student data that's being transferred. It seems like a quite a big um, undertaking. So timeline wise. Lisa, why don't you go ahead and, and respond to those two questions? So um, I have spoken to a district in, um, in the Illinois area that has switched from specifically Naviance to school links. And she shared, um, you know, exactly kind of what their implementation timeline and process was. Um, and so, you know, we've got a, a, a lot of really great information to kind of have in our back pocket as we kind of plan this out. Um, we are meeting with school links at uh, pending board, of, now that we've got the board approval, we are meeting with them um, very shortly to do kind of a kickoff meeting to discuss a lot of these kind of technical, you know, kind of questions just to make sure that we're on the right page. And um, I do know that school links has done this so many times that they said by the end of that kickoff meeting, they could probably have the rostering and everything kind of really set up. So they've, they've really assured us um, that they can do this very easily. I did want to add one other thing is that um, our contract with Naviance is still through um, July 14th, I believe. And so all of the college stuff that the seniors are working on currently will be completed through Naviance. Um, we will get school links started so that we can have that going and ready to go now so we can train, but then switch over um, in the fall for the incoming seniors so that they'll start all of their college stuff with the new platform. Excellent. Any, any further questions? I have a question. I feel like sometimes these programs are so fantastic and then the classroom teacher doesn't necessarily know. And I know one of the things that I feel like would be really helpful, particularly if it focuses on a student's strengths, is that every teacher that that student has will have mm -hmm. access mm -hmm. to this information. Is there, mm -hmm. is yeah. there a capability to do that? Is there an intent to do that? Is that possible? That's a great question, Trustee Anderson. Um, Lisa, why don't you respond on the implementation for the last phase we were discussing, um, obviously, and being very transparent, we know the teachers are dealing with a lot right now. Um, you know, we're, we're taking this incrementally, but we certainly had the plan for our teachers to be um, familiar with this program and all that it can provide. So Lisa, why don't you speak a little bit to that? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I think once this gets up and running and the counselors kind of identify which curriculum they're going to be delivering and presenting with the students and engaging with the students, there are over 80 kind of like activities and experiences and things that we can customize and, 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 and create for the students. So the plan is really to, to maximize use of this tool and to get those CTE teachers and all teachers really kind of involved in accessing this platform, not only to kind of find out student interests, but to actually have them do some, you know, career planning. And, and mm -hmm. so that's really our goal is to kind of maximize use of that. So we'll work closely with school links and our counseling team to identify which activities and, and lessons the counselors are going to focus on and which ones we'll have our teachers focus on. I want to add one more thing to that, Trustee Anderson, on your question. I think that's the most important part of this. Lisa, right now, she started a counselor work group as part of her, part of her, as part of her job, and she meets with them on a regular basis. And that group is really gaining some steam, and really want to bridge uh, what we're doing with counselors and teachers because that's been something that we want to build on. And this program will allow us to do that. But like any other implementation, bottom line is we need to make that happen. And as Lisa discussed, she's going to do that through her counseling group. She also works with the teachers as well. So we're putting one foot in front of the other and we really want to make this implementation as successful as possible. Great, thank you. Okay, seeing no further hands. Um, the motion is to approve the agreement with school links for Newport Mesa Unified School District. Roll call vote, please. Student board member, Maddie McNamer. Yes. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. Trustee Barto. Yes. Trustee Matoye. Yes. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Crane. 
Yes. Trustee Wagen. Yes. Uh, next item 19, community input on non-agendized items. And we do have six speakers on various topics. One on recent hate crimes in the community, one on an unspecified topic, one on weekend public access to schoolyards, and three on transition of secondary schools to level one. Trustee Matwaye, would you read the following statement? Speakers wishing to address the board on special agenda topics on non-agendized items have submitted the appropriate comment card on the district website by no later than 11 a.m. today, Tuesday, March 30th, 2021. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Thank you. And Mrs. Fish, would you bring up the speakers, please? Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Mrs. Yelsey. Um, our first topic is on the recent hate crimes in the community. And the speaker is Mary Lynn Gaddis. You have three minutes. Please unmute yourself, state your name for the meeting record, and begin speaking. Good evening. This is Mary Lynn Gaddis, and uh, I'm a parent um, and have children at Newport Harbor High School. With the recent hate crimes on the rise against Asians and Blacks, what is the district board and superintendent stance condemning hate and violence against these communities? Nothing has been said while other school districts in our county, state, and nationally have condemned discrimination, hate racism, racial injustice, along with violence. These include the Irvine District, districts in Northern California and many colleges and universities. This past Sunday, Ku Klux Klan flyers were left in the neighborhood within a mile from Newport Harbor High School in Eastside Costa Mesa. What is the district doing to educate against such violent groups? As a parent of black children in the Newport Mesa district, I'd like to hear from you as board members and the superintendent on what your position is and why to date there's been nothing but silence on these issues. During Black Lives Matter, nothing was said. The recent attacks on Asians, not a word. It is my understanding that in our district, whites make up approximately 55%, followed by Hispanics at 37, with the remainder being Asian, Blacks, or others. What are you doing to address these minorities in making the children of minorities in our school district feel safe? The cost of staying silent since George Floyd, since George Floyd has been on our schools, our students, administrators and staff who've had to speak out, rightfully so, without knowing where you as the leadership of the district stands on these hate-fueled, hate racially motivated events in our society. Don't leave these out in the wind anymore. Do you agree that we need to know that the leadership of the district condemns these acts? Silence cannot be tolerated any longer. If I stay silent, then who am I? Our children are watching and they need transparent leadership now more than ever. Superintendent Lee Song, I heard your comments tonight, and while I appreciate those, um, those shared sentiments, when will this statement be issued publicly, communicated with a district-wide communication plan with plan actions as stated? As a parent and as a community member, we have heard nothing from the Human Relations Task Force that you mentioned, nothing. There's limited information on your website. Nothing has been communicated to, to us. And I'd like to know why. And moving forward, I would really like to hear from the board members on this topic and what statements will be released as well as the planned actions. Some of our leaders in our city since this evening, since your meeting started tonight, have stated that the uh, KKK flyers are nothing more than freedom of speech and that no charges will be filed by the person apprehended by the Newport Beach Police Department. I would like to hear from you as educators and representing the entire Newport Mesa School District, what your stamps is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is on an unspecified topic is Jeff Elvander. You have three minutes. Please unmute yourself, state your name for the meeting record and begin speaking. Good evening. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Elvander, please start again. There. Okay, are we there? Our, our, Thank you. Okay, if everyone can hear me. I, I'm speaking on behalf of the kids. And I think the board has heard this many times from all of the parents, maybe not so much the administration, but our, our kids truly are suffering in hybrid. And while I know it's a lot of work and I applaud the board and the administration for transitioning back those elementary school students to full time, I, for all of the same reasons that Mr. Lee Sung gave, right, the, his guiding principles and uh, all of those reasons for getting elementary students back, those are the same reasons why we need to get the secondary students back. And so I think we really missed a great opportunity tonight because now many schools are in fact planning that and I hope that that plan is underway from the school district. There is a leadership that is bringing back secondary students full time to the districts in Brea, Olinda, Placentia, Yorba, Santa Monica, Malibu, Carlsbad, Chino Valley, to name a few. They all have some very strong leadership bringing their kids back after spring break, full time secondary kids, students, because these kids are hurting. These kids are suffering. It's a very passionate subject. And again, I know there's a lot of work that goes into this and a lot of planning. And what I'm afraid of is because I didn't hear that tonight was that that planning has not taken place from the administration, from our leadership. And I think we really have a week to hear back from, from the administration and the leadership on what is going to happen with our secondary students. And I hope we hear that back before spring break, which is really by the end of this week, so that we know. And it's a great opportunity for you to learn as we reopen fall, if we get them back. I hear a lot of excuses. There's a lot of finger pointing. If we can do it for the elementary school students, again, we can do it for our secondary students. We're all here for the kids. Again, it's a lot of hard work, but thank you for getting our kids, our secondary kids back full time with our elementary kids this year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker on the topic of weekend public access to schoolyards is Michelle Eriks. You have three minutes. Please unmute yourself, state your name for the meeting record and begin speaking. I had, I had all these messages like, Hello, can you hear me? This is Michelle Erickson. Yes, yes. Please. good evening. Newport Mesa School Board. I'm requesting public access to Victoria Elementary Playground area on weekends. It is my understanding that over 15 requests have been made via email to access schoolyards on weekends, specifically Victoria. I represent those people who want to avoid prolonging this meeting, and I will represent them here. Open the gates, please. Prior to COVID, the playground and schoolyard was open to neighborhood and school community. For over 12 months, the gates have been locked. I have asked approval through our site principal, Dr. Peralta. Dr. Peralta is supportive of opening the playground for weekend access, but the district has instructed him that it is to remain locked. Why? Here are the reasons I believe that public school playground should be open to the public. I believe all these reasons were valid prior to COVID, but with COVID, several are increasingly critical. Green space is good for mental health. Green space is good for physical health. Open access to school builds community and connection. Public schools are public property. I am cautiously optimistic that the pandemic will continue to move in a positive direction. I believe in of opening the schoolyards on the weekend at Victoria and all Newport Mesa schools would be a significant step to helping community members improve their mental and physical health. The mental and physical health of this school community must be the priority. If this request is to be denied, I respectfully ask for a reason why. Trustee Yelsey, I thank you for your response to my email inquiry. You indicated there were COVID safety considerations. What are these considerations specifically? You said that you will be meeting with Mr. Lee Song regarding this issue. When is this meeting? What is the timeline for this to be addressed? You said new guidelines would come out allowing for flexibility. What are the current guidelines? Who makes these guidelines? Currently all city parks are open, county parks are open, state parks are open, national parks are open, Disneyland is opening in a few weeks. Can the public asset access what the joint use agreement is between the district and the city? 
the answer no is just not acceptable. Where there is a will, there is a way. If the mental, mental and physical well-being of this community is truly your priority, you will find a way. On a final note, I was also made aware that prior to last night, Costa Mesa Little League was not officially approved for games. It seems after many emails were sent, it somehow got approved. Why are things so hard? Why do issues need to become a blazing fire to get anyone's attention? COVID is not going away. This is our new normal. We need to adjust and be able to operate and manage in this environment. Public access and community use of district fields and playgrounds is not complicated. Respectfully, Michelle Erickson, Victoria PTA President, Superintendent Advisory Council Representative, and Costa Mesa Little League Volunteer Coach. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, next up on the topic of transition to secondary, of secondary schools to level one. Um, the first comment card is submitted by Katie Kossoff. I do not locate her in the list of participants. So next up will be Kelly Foley. You have three minutes, please unmute yourself and state your name for the meeting record and begin speaking. Kelly, are you there? You need to unmute yourself. Okay, one more try for Kelly Foley. If you unmute your mic. All right, Kelly is not responding. The last comment card is from Victoria Boyko, but she also is not in the list of attendees. So President Yelsey, there are no more speakers in the queue. Hey, thank you. Wait a minute. I think she unmuted Kelly fully unmuted herself. So I think it might be a connection issue. Do you want to try Kelly one more time? Kelly, are you there? I don't hear any response. List either. Oh, there she is up at the top. Well, we, for some reason, can't make a connection. So. No, I'm wondering if there's, because this happened last time, if there's something that we can do either with like setting up a timeline where people can wait, it's really difficult with the current context. There's got to be another solution. Well, we can address that, but I think we gave a pretty good indication for the discussion action when that would be. We notified all the speakers uh, that they, it would be earlier in the agenda. And non-agendized items because we want to do our business first are always at the end of the meeting. I understand. I just, I think it's really difficult for particularly because a lot of these are parents to be able to be on and have it ready in like a 30 second. I just, I think I would like to see if there's another option we can provide, even if we Okay, I know this is difficult some... because we can have people in the boardroom, so. Yeah, I wonder if we can go and actually also have the option of the written version, if people maybe, I just think- we're, offer... we, we're not going to do both, and we were on the written version and everybody wanted us to come to in on, just to, to give their own comments. Uh, so we chose to go with that option, so that's how we'll- State. But of course, if someone sent us an email, the entire board would be reading it. We so. will be. We will read anything that's sent us as a board. Our, our our speakers could do that as a backup. By the way, this is what I'm going to say tonight. Blah blah. And, and sometimes and that then sometimes we'll happens. I that's an option. That. I just for me personally, I I would like to offer as many options as possible for people to communicate with us in our public meeting. That's what I'm saying. Appreciate the comments, <laughs> Trustee Anderson. Um, before we go on, I think all of these topics that were discussed were addressed somewhat except weekend public access to schoolyards. So Superintendent Lee Sung, would you like to make any comments on that one? Yes, I, I would just like to comment on uh, the request to open up Victoria Elementary to the public for community use. I uh, just want you to know that we did have a recent conversation now that we are approaching the orange tier, uh, that we believe it, this is a good opportunity to talk about whether we can 
uh, open our schools. And I just want to make it clear that, you know, the decision to close our school campuses, these are not public <coughs> works, these are school campuses, was done as part of the guidance, part of our uh, emphasis to maintain a safe, safe school campus for our students and staff. So that's why we had done that. Uh, but now that the uh, numbers are coming down and community transmission is far less than what it was just a few weeks and months ago, that we do believe this is the time to revisit that. So we will work with our principals, we will work with our MNO uh, to see if we can do that. And I think the timing moving to orange uh, is a good good opportunity. Thank you. And And isn't that something also that we would be working with the city of Costa Mesa because Typically, they would provide um, ambassadors to our sites if we have them open in the evening and sometimes on the weekends, if they're open, they would peruse it. So maybe we could, in, in one of your several talks <laughs> with the city, bring that one up again too, because that's always a nice safety factor. Yes, and, and we do appreciate working with city staff on that when it's a, when it's a shared facility. Uh, but if it's a school campus, that's, a, you know, that's still ours. Uh, our responsibility. Trustee okay. Metoye, what do you mean by uh, ambassadors? The city of Costa Mesa, um, oh gosh, maybe five five years ago, um, set up a group of, of personnel that were designed specifically to go out and check yeah, our school properties that we share. For example, if you have a YSO or Little League playing on our fields, they come out because we have a joint use agreement with the city that after four o'clock, our, our school sites are open to use by the public, which then is more city than us. So while, we, while our custodians are on campus, typically, I have no idea what their schedule is going to be like right now. No, I was just going to go say this is not on our agenda. So oh, we I'm cannot sorry. go too deep in this. We okay. can we can discuss it at another time. I just Good wanted point. Superintendent Lee Sung to address the comment that was. Thank you. And okay. I couldn't see her hand from her backpack. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank if you. We could follow up too, just for the timeline, because I know that people like them open before spring break. Thank you. Daylight savings time went. Oh, yeah. The school Thank time. you. Um, we're into informal reports. Superintendent Lee Sung, do you have anything else? No, I was able to give my report earlier. Thank you. Okay, we will move on and I will not confuse people tonight. Dr. Jockham. Great, thank you. I've learned to wait, so that's, <laughs> that's a good thing. So as we talk about um, COVID and different um, elements of COVID and teaching, and teachers having to adjust and families having to adjust. One of the things we haven't talked about is uh, one of the programs that we implemented through our support with um, special education and human resources, and that is our home hospital or uh, via distance learning for our students who have special needs. And these are kids typically with pretty significant um, physical or other needs that did not allow them to attend their regular school campus. And it really wasn't appropriate for them to attend cloud campus either due to the support levels that they needed. So we, um, we do have teachers for students in our mod severe programs and for students in our autism specific programs. And um, they've really done a great job trying to learn this, this type of work on the fly and families have been very um, appreciative and supportive of this. And so I just wanted to acknowledge them because it's a group that is small, but it does really make a difference for kids and families. And that is um, right now we have Kelly Adams and Daisha Marino who are doing our preschool special ed programs. We have Johnny Westermeyer Thanofanos and Aaron Gordon who are doing our elementary program. And we have Nathan Swanick and Shelly Hoff who are providing support to our secondary students. So um, just wanna acknowledge the work that they're doing as well during this uh, pandemic. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Mrs. Olson. Thank you. I wasn't sure if it was going to be me. I thought you. Were I told you I wasn't going to confuse you tonight. <laughs> <with Mr. Drake. laughs> We're going to um, order. 
No, I thank you very much. I, I would just like to acknowledge a couple of things tonight um, on the consent calendar. Thank you so much for approving the two MOUs that are there. Uh, one of them is the teacher work calendar. And I just really, truly appreciate the patience of our community waiting. I know it was a little bit later than what we normally um, announce our start dates. And the great news is that we have two years. So we have a start date for this coming year, 21-22, as well as for 22-23. And the calendar committee, I appreciate all of their time, um, their contributions to the conversation. And um, thank NMFT for um, entering into the MOU and doing this very, very quickly. <laughs> Our other MOU um, is a little bit different and I just wanna highlight it. it. It was for a the summer administrative intern. So we talk about providing leadership opportunities for our teachers so that they can grow and hopefully um, at some point go into administration or just exhibit and using those leadership skills in their everyday work. And so that MOU provides us to do that, um, to take somebody out of the teaching into the administrative uh, ranks just for the summer. And we actually have eight positions that we are going to be filling. And so we're very excited about that. So thank you very much. For thank you. Us. Mr. Drake. Two items just to share, two experiences. Um, one uh, last week, and it'll be no su surprise to you, um, but I was able to participate um, with some of the colleagues here in uh, our LCAP stakeholder input process uh, that Vanessa Gailey put together. She did an amazing job putting this together uh, in this environment. Uh, it was done virtually. Uh, it was done with Jamboard, with breakout rooms for uh, elementary, middle, and high school, and Spanish-speaking parents of all levels uh, with facilitators. Uh, and I was able to facilitate on three separate uh, occasions um, and had the pleasure of uh, one time doing it with uh, Dr. Jockham. Uh, and uh, it was just, a, it was an experience, uh, a great time to just sit and listen and be able to listen with uh, lots of questions being asked, but not having the answers, knowing that when we get all this feedback, we'll get back together um, with Vanessa and uh, the group and decide how we want to move forward, not only just next year in planning, but for the next three years. Uh, but it was a really positive experience. Parents um, were able to, in these rooms, just have a conversation, share with us their input around academics, around our social emotional programs, and also around supports for them. Uh, and uh, I, I just uh, really want to uh, commend um, Vanessa Gailey on that whole process. The other piece uh, that I want to share with you uh, is along with all of the operational um, pieces that are, are in the air for elementary um, principals bringing kids back full time. Um, they are also working extremely hard around the, the teaching and learning part that will also um, be enhanced as we bring kids back uh, with more time. Specifically, uh, we've decided to move forward with some common assessments in mathematics that they're currently giving. Our third through sixth graders will be taking the interim assessment blocks this next week around fractions, uh, which we know are the <laughs> probably most critical content in mathematics for our kids to know and understand, and the biggest predictor uh, beyond socio, uh, socioeconomic status or anything along those lines for algebraic success. Mm -hmm. So that'll be great feedback for us and actionable feedback for us. And then our first and second graders at this point have also taken a, a quick common assessment and was able to spend, we'll, we'll spend time with each zone set of principles, actually going through and looking at student work after we've learned some about the uh, different strategic levels our, st our standards are calling for in relation to their um, uh, ways of solving addition and, and subtraction problems. Uh, and it's just really incredible to watch these principles, <coughs> everything else they, they have going on, uh, really engage in this work, knowing that it's gonna not only move learning forward for the remaining two months, but into the summer and into next year as well. So a lot of really great stuff going on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Baumeister. We uh, do so much planning for the future that sometimes we forget to celebrate the great things that are happening in our classrooms right now. So I have three things that I wanna bring to you right now. 
And the first one is I'd like to thank Superintendent Lee Sung for recognizing the work of the Human Relations Task Force. And that work is ongoing to look at the implementation plan. I just wanna let you know that we are implementing the implementation plan. <laughs> and so one of the things I wanted to highlight is at our last meeting, we had the principal at early college, Dave Martinez, and the principal at Newport Harbor High School, Sean Bolton, share out about the virtual visits that their 10th grade world history classes are making to the Museum of Tolerance. We are still doing that in a virtual format. And the word that they both used is that it was life-changing for students. Again, it's one thing to read it in a history book. It's one thing for a teacher to lecture about it. It's another to hear personal experiences from Holocaust survivors. It just takes it to another level. And so that work is still going on with the Human Relations Task Force. I also wanna let you know that we are also planning uh, staff anti-bias training for the fall for our, our secondary schools when they come back, working with Shannon McGowan and the ADL. And you know, you guys went through that training. What a great anti-bias training it is for everybody. Um, the second program I wanted to highlight is I got an email from Denise Weiland, who is our facilitator from the Living History Program. And I know Trustee Yelsey got the, the same email. There was a Living History Zoom session at the cloud the other day, and we had a, a couple teachers write emails to Denise, and I wanted to share with you their words. The first teacher said it was a pleasure to have this veteran speak to our students. We appreciate his service and the work that both of you do with the Living History Program. I've been so proud to be affiliated with this organization over the years. And I know that our students get so much out of the presentations. I always tell them it's one thing for me to lecture about these events like the Vietnam War, but it's invaluable the personal touches that Bob and the other veterans can lend to give these events such a perspective. I look forward to doing this again and continuing the work with the Living History Program. The other teacher said, I like, I'd like to echo Scott's sentiments. It's always a special day for me for one of our veterans to come to class and talk with our students. I believe this is one of the best experiences and educational opportunities for young people. I thank you and for, I thank you for your time and look forward to a lasting relationship with the Living History Program and our American heroes. So the Living History Program is going on. And again, another program that is, is really life-changing for our kids to talk to those veterans. And the last one that I wanted to let you know is the State Seal of Biliteracy. I'm sure you all know what that is, but it is really a, it's a high level for our kids and it's that they demonstrate profici proficiency in more than one language other than English. So English and at least one other language. And this year of our graduating seniors, we have 388 students that have qualified for the yeah. seal of biliteracy. And just to give you an idea, that's almost a quarter of our, se our graduating seniors have qualified for the seal of biliteracy, quite a standard Excellent. and quite an accomplishment and something that we should all be very proud of. Just that, wanna let you know that those things that are going on in our classrooms right now. Thank you, That that is amazing. And thank you for sharing because we sometimes get so caught up in just COVID issues Especially. that we don't really hear about all the good things that are happening. And I know, for instance, with the Living History Program, I've talked to Denise periodic throughout the year, and there are meetings, uh, members of the Freedom Committee who have attended quite a few of our schools already to provide the programs on Zoom, even though they can't be in person. So. All these things are wonderful. We just don't get to hear about them. There are great things going on in our classrooms. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure I shared that with everybody. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Holcomb. Yes, well, uh, you heard in the level one presentation about uh, Ms. Zaresny's involvement. And I just wanted to take a moment tonight to put that in perspective that she and her department are very small and they have very, very full-time jobs and a lot of projects and things going on all of the time. And then on top of all of that, we're in that season where uh, charter school submittals are very, very uh, time consuming and they have very, very tight deadlines and they work very, very diligently on that. And then she was immediately grateful as soon as Kathleen Leary, and uh, we really appreciate how much she had uh, sought the wisdom that Ada could provide. And Ada then also uh, worked to coordinate so that it was easier for that team uh, not to have to work with all the other uh, 
uh, directors within the business department. So she was coordinating with all of them, uh, took this all on uh, during a very, very busy time uh, with her team. And so I thought tonight would be a great time to just uh, give her a shout out for really working a lot of very late nights to, uh, to keep us up with all of this stuff right now. So thank you. Thank you so Excellent. much. And thank Ada. Uh, Jeff Trader, Mr. Trader. Spring is a wonderful time for a number of reasons, but most of all, most importantly, spring is a wonderful time because that's the beginning of the 2021 audit. <laughs> so uh, we work with your auditors very closely. We come up with an audit plan. Um, the audit is a principal document that's used by the state, by uh, Wall Street to uh, make sure that we're compliant and there, believe me, there is a lot of compliance. There's a lot of crossing T's and dotting I's. And so I just want to, you know, we're beginning that uh, process now and, and we'll look forward to a, again, a, a clean audit. Thank you so much. Um, board member reports. Do we have any board member reports? Or I know, I know we do have committee reports, but do you want to combine them? I can combine them, yeah. That's okay. Um, would you like to do DLAC and? Yeah, let's do DLAC. Okay. Um, the, the DLAC report was really great. We, our meeting was great. We were able to go over um, the summer program. Um, and so the parents were able to hear all of that. There were a lot of questions about um, secondary and what that would look like, but really excited to have um, opportunities. There's one parent from um, California that um, was also really interested because California is not a Title I school. And so she had a lot of very specific questions. She was like, I want these at California as well. Um, and so DLAC was great. And then also um, it was an opportunity to go over some um, of the technology components and make sure that parents really understood and had access. Um, and yeah, so that, that meeting was a wonderful meeting. Um, I'm really excited that we were able to have um, Carla as the DOI president speak for the first time and I'm hoping that will be in an ongoing fashion. Um, she's actually bilingual so she's able to do it in English and Spanish and I think it would be a great opportunity for her to, to be able to speak for herself. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Bartow, would you like to add to that or go on? I wasn't able to attend that one, that particular DOAC. Okay. Um, uh, would you like to do crop now? Sure. <laughs> Okay, um, well, for my board member report, I'm very excited to see sports come back and see how well Newport Harbor football is doing the first couple weeks. Um, and for my crop report, we have been talking about um, funding and a lot of the funding that's coming for school districts is not really going for ROPs, but the, the good news is that um, Patrick O'Donnell has uh, pushed forward a bill AB 839 to increase the CTE incentive grant funding from 150 million to 300 million. And uh, our and Cotty Petrie Norris suggested she might be interested in co authoring that bill. So that's really great because they could really use that funding. They are in a, in a difficult position where they're changing their systems to serve children and high school students more uh, in a virtual setting without really the, the funds to make that pivot. Um, however, they are currently going under undergoing their WASC approval process. And so far that's going well. It got pushed out a year. It normally would have to be completed this year. It's now pushed out to next year. So they're working on focus groups and things like that to get the process started. Um, and then most interestingly, I think they are working on developing a new pathway and that's a cybersecurity pathway. So they met with a Leadership Alliance OC and other um, folks in that space in Orange County to further develop their cybersecurity pathway as a, an additional pathway that they offer for students, um, which I think will be really great with, the, with all the, the challenges that we face in that direction going forward. And that's it. Thank you. Trustee Crane, CAC. Yes, I had the pleasure of attending my first Community Alliance Committee meeting and uh, it was very enlightening. Uh, we heard from two of our school facilities coordinators, uh, Ms. Diaz and Ms. Gaetan Alarcon and they had provided some feedback as to 
uh, how the community is doing. And uh, basically the, uh, the community was very uh, grateful for the Chromebooks that were provided uh, um, to their students and families and um, also the hotspots, et cetera. And some of the needs that I heard when they spoke was the fact that they would love to have the kids back in class learning because that's where they learn best. So that was good news for us since we're going to launch that on April 21st for the primary. Um, they um, also uh, were very grateful for the, well, actually they, they had spoke about attendance um, support. And I do know that our SROs and other um, intervention teachers and such are, are reaching out to the community in order to increase attendance for the community, the students. Um, I was incredibly impressed by our community partners that are so involved um, in the after school, uh, after school programs, uh, partners such as uh, Save Our Youth, Girls Inc., Dr. Reba, Hogue Mental Health, Assistance League, Partners for Wellness, Priority Center, Waymakers, and just amazing the support. Um, and many actually of these partners are trying to pivot to in, in person in order to make more of that human connection versus the virtual. Um, and the, an announcement, which was exciting, is that they are organizing a mental health awareness event on May 8th that's going to involve, I believe, an art, an art contest, a 5K virtual, and uh, more to come uh, as far as information. So May 8th, start training for that 5K. <laughs> <laughs> and if and, I could just, oh, oh uh, go ahead if you want to add to it. I just wanted to add, um, it was wonderful to have Kristen Henry and Sarah Coley lead it together. And this was the first time that, because so many, so many partners had been asking, how can we serve? It's been tricky, you know, with the schools not being open. And so to have a list and see elementary, here are our current needs and for secondary. So partners were able to see like, oh, here, here's what's been done, but here are some ongoing needs. And then to hear within that meeting, one of the things that came up consecutively was we really need on-site counseling. Mm -hmm. And like, they're able to do that with Melinda Hogue. And so Rosie was like, we can set up appointments. So I think even just within that short meeting to have actionable results was really huge. So it was one of the best community alliances yeah. I've ever been to. So I just wanted to follow up on that. Yes, and in fact, Trustee Anderson, you're the one who, who solicited um, the Hogue Mental Health. Was it Lucia Vega? And you asked her if she could come to the sites and I believe they're gonna work on that. So that's wonderful. And uh, also Michelle O'Neill was very insightful. She's the uh, early childhood um, coordinator. representative coordinator. And um, so otherwise uh, it's been refreshing and wonderful going on campus. Uh, yesterday I happened to be at, at CDM and I went and I saw an amazing uh, group of uh, performing arts kids, theater kids. They're working on a set outside because of they're preparing for their upcoming production. And there was such joy and energy, positive energy. It was just very heartening. And then went over to CDM baseball that was going on, you know, parents wearing their masks and athletes doing their thing. It's just, you know, back to normalcy, progress, gratitude. Um, we're going in the right direction. Thank you. It is great to see the kids playing sports. To see, you know, they're back in their element the and, and they're all really enjoying it. Kids so that, being kids. Yep, that's great. Um, and student, uh, superintendent student advisory committee, uh, Trustee Crane and I are both on it, as well as the superintendent, since it is his committee. Um, and I can start, you can chime in. Uh, they had as a topic this week, it is facilitated by Dr. Diagostino, who does an excellent job with the group. And the question was, what can we do as a leadership group to promote positive school culture? And they talked about that a lot, but they didn't come up with concrete answers yet for actually this year and for, next, for the summer going into next year. Same things we talk about, and the, the students are all really concerned about this. And some of, the, some of the issues they brought up are the same things we talk about, like um, how do they incentivize students to come back from cohort C 
And in many of the schools, students who have been on cohort C have caused other students who would like to be in person not to come because they don't wanna be the only person in their class at the time, which is really unfortunate. And so I think they also would like a big push and they're trying to think of ways as a student community that they can do that to get the kids back. Um, as one of them says, no one likes to be in an empty classroom with just one person and a teacher. Um, and they also said sometimes it's difficult having a mix of virtual and in-person at the same time. They find it a little disruptive. That was some of the comments. And they also said they never know who's gonna show up because some people just stay out in cohort C. It's not like they tell the teacher in advance. Oh, nice. I don't think in general that they're mm -hmm. coming. It's kind of a mix. So they have, uh, there are issues that they want to tackle and try to address as well as staff wants to tackle and address those. So hope they'll probably come up with solutions be before we do. So hopefully we'll check back and hear from them. Anyway, it was, it was um, they always have a great session. And then did you have a Costa Mesa um, Chamber of Commerce meeting? Yes, I do, but go right ahead. Trustee Yelsey, we, we also heard from the um, ASB advisors that we're already planning some of the um, senior, act, uh, senior activities right, as, or all that. Yeah. And uh, they discussed graduation. And so, you know, again, progress. Yes. <laughs> yes, and I'll do my combination also with that okay. too. Um, the Costa Mesa, Chamber of Commerce Education Committee is well under its way, well underway to um, providing our Les Miller student recognition again this year. It's, we're, they're trying to figure out how to do a hybrid of them because we certainly can't get everybody together at Volcom yet because that was way fun to do. Um, they're soliciting funds from the communities to make the swag bags even more swaggy. And um, and the recognition for those that don't know, or for the usually for the top fifteen scholars at the high schools, and because Costa Mesa is very collegiate, it's also Vanguard University, Orange Coast College, and we include Back Bay and Early College because they sit in our zone. So it's a it's a wonderful wonderful opportunity. So they're well underway working with that. And because we've had so much emphasis on wellness recently, I noticed that many of our class, uh, many of our schools that are focused on wellness are in the Costa Mesa zone. And I've been to one recovery, one on campus, and it's fabulous. I'm excited that it's going to um, two other schools, and I know it's underway at Estancia and fledgling at Newport Harbor but also Costa Mesa High School who has their own. I was very familiar with that. And then I went, well, I'm not familiar with the other two. So I dropped, I dropped into Palo Reno and it was a wonderful discussion with um, Principal Schwartz and um, gosh, I can never remember Crystal's last name, the school psychologist. And they were explaining to me all about their virtual wellness center and how fabulous it's been working. And I said, what do you mean virtual? How, how can students access that? And it was actually the cutest thing you've ever seen on their website. It's, it's a room that, that is a virtual like living room. And then it's decorated monthly as any good elementary teacher would do with the seasons of what they're going to have. So it's a friendly place to stop. And if you, it's very interactive. If you click on certain icons, you get hints and things to do. And it, we discovered that it's a great place for children to self-select without anyone knowing that they've been there. And then it also provides an excellent place for classroom teachers to then get their wellness team working. So that was wonderful. And I went over to Davis to talk about the um, help their child survey, their health, wellness survey and saw it and I said, well, gee, I would collect most of these no on any one given day too. It was an easy to be used survey. The children do it. It's, it's, the, it's, it's not totally anonymous, but it, the classroom teachers know their own students and they're coming up with an icon version for K, K and one so that they can be participating too. The data should be fascinating and it gives just more input. It's not because our teachers they know their students, but it's 
with masks on and things, it just gives them another layer of, oh, you're not feeling well today. So it's just, it's, it's a just, a, you know, since we don't have health offices, we didn't have health offices for the kids to go visit. And every one of the, everybody that I talked to complimented Care Solace and what a great thing we did by including that. So thank you for bringing it to us because it has really been a help to our community. And lastly, it was really nice to hear the band playing at the football game. Made the difference and they're excited about, <laughs> ex thank you. Thank you. Know, you. excited about uh, their competitions. Thank you. Trustee Mitoye, you forgot to mention the fact that uh, Trustee Yelsey, Mitoye, and Crane attended the early college high school open house. <gasps> That's right, I did forget that. So feel free to say something. We did that. <laughs> well, well, I, actually, one thing that was nice about it this year versus when we're there is each of the teachers oh, got up, well, on no. Zoom, um, but talked about themselves and what they did and what their program was. And when we've been in person, they haven't had that opportunity. So that part was nice. That was very nice. And then after that section, each teacher was open for their own Zoom so parents could go into their Zoom rooms and talk even more. It was a wonderful open house. Thank very you, nice. Mrs. Crane. Right. Anyway, if there are no further comments. Oh, I I had one. Um, as I was talking to some teachers in the past few weeks, um, particularly the RTI and the SIPS teachers were asking if it was possible to um, order some masks for themselves and for their students, because a big part of literacy and phonics is being able to see, and for speech as well, um, to be able to see what the teacher's mouths are doing and for the teachers to see the students. So that was a request that I heard um, at two different school sites. Um, and then I also just wanted to follow up on the link between attendance and then we talked about the SROs. Often attendance goes into discipline and I really, I, I really can't say it again. Like we need to figure out a way to have transportation beefed up. It really, it goes into attendance and it goes into discipline and it, it dramatically impacts the Estancia zone in big ways and Newport Harbor zone. So if we can please figure that out. Thank, Thank you. you. The, the thing about the mask, I've also heard from some of the principals that they've tried clear mask and they fog up. I don't know, Dr. Jockham, if you have had an, is that what you've heard? So yeah, I, I, because I've been around to several schools lately and I've heard that comment several times from the principals. Um, so well, I, I think if they're offered, it would be helpful and then maybe they can figure out a way and hold it like that or, you know, I don't know. There were several teachers who asked. So um, we do we did order some of those for um, students in special education as well for for speech therapy and um, found several of the same things they get um, foggy and wet inside because um, it's plastic. Um, but the uh, and another option is also um, we have we do have face shields with the drapes and that's also an option during that time. So. Um, the face shields and the drapes should be available at every school site and students can use that during that time. Um, and then I will work with uh, Mr. Drake on the, um, on the face masks if they want to, people want to give them a try. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments? Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn the meeting. Second. Okay, moved and adjourned, moved and seconded at 8.55. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Yay.